Good morning, afternoon, or evening, and welcome to the Bloody Disgusting Network. The following show is just horrifying. Beware. Yes, I did it. I killed Yvette. I hated her so much. It, it, the, it, flame, flames, flames on the side of my face, breathing, breath, heaving breaths. And welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking a matter of life after death. Now that he's dead, I have a life. We're talking, I was in the hall. I know because I was there. And we're talking one plus two plus two plus one. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. And we're talking flames on the side, heaving, breathing, on the side of my face. (laughs) (laughs) Happy Halloween, everybody. We are talking Clue, in case you couldn't figure it out. (laughs) Yes, it's the episode that demanded us to try and recreate both vocal mannerisms as well as physical pratfalls on an audio-only medium. Joe, I... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I I we'll get into this in a bit, but I have seen this movie countless times. And taking mm-hmm. well, it was one of those movies where I was like, well, do I even need to watch this again to take notes? And the answer is always yes. The answer is yes, one hundred percent. And I still like cackled my entire way through it. But I was also like, my notes are just quotes. Like I wasn't writing yes. down any plot i have no idea i have (laughs) never had this much trouble writing notes on a movie because i'm like well what am i gonna say i'm just gonna say the lines (laughs) yeah basically yeah it it's one of those things where we've talked about comedies a couple of times this year and it's so tempting to just say oh i'm just gonna do all the jokes i almost had the opposite problem where i said okay don't pay attention to the jokes because Mm -hmm. you are in charge of the plot and it was like oh my god it's so nonsensical and just like It's all there, and yet it also doesn't matter at all. Not at all. When we get into the reception, we'll talk about that a bit. But maybe maybe we can have some help in in discussing this film. (laughs) All right, everyone. They are the hosts of Good Morning, Nancy, an intersectional and queer podcast in which two best friends talk about their favorite scary movies. Please welcome Gracie Jarvis and Abby Brown. Hi! Hi! Hi. We're here. And we're, we are, actually, we are queer, and we are, we are ready to talk about Clue. (laughs) Oh my god, I'm so excited, I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) We are excited to have you both, oh my god, like, A, this energy that I'm feeling is wonderful. (laughs) Yes! (laughs) So, okay, I mean, this is a bit, I mean, as Joe said, right, like, this is a comedy, like, we, we don't typically do, like, just comedies, but what brought y'all onto this? What, what, what is your connection with this film of of ours, Clue? Holy cats. Well, so for me, I actually had to really think about, like, how did I first get introduced to this film? Right. So, um, I actually was in Clue the Musical. (gasps) What? (laughs) Yes. I played Mrs. Peacock. <laughs> oh, best best character in the movie. I don't know oh, how oh, I, I, I have thoughts. I have thoughts. <laughs> oh my god. Gracie, I forgot about that. I know. So it was my sophomore well, it was the start of my sophomore year of college. I was in it. And um uh, yeah, I was Mrs. Peacock, who's more like Mrs. White in the film. Mm, so yeah. I sort of tried to like use both energies like you know because mrs peacock in the movie is very nervous but then like you have like mrs white who's very dramatic and Mm -hmm. and kind of a femme fatale or whatever so i just kind of used both when i played it but our director told us to watch this movie and to kind of base our characters off of them and so when i that was the first time i saw it and you know i'm not gonna lie when i first saw it i thought Eh, about 80% of these jokes are not landing for me. <gasps> wow. Oh, yeah, okay. when I first so when I first saw it. So, um now and I actually told Abby this um before we started uh recording, but I watched it this time and I was like, "Oh my gosh." I was like, "This film is so funny." Like <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I don't know if I had to like grow into it or if I was just like a snotty teen or something. And I was like, "I don't know if I get any of these jokes." I don't know, but I just maybe now I'm just like 
I'm just... So before this viewing, you thought you did not like this movie very much. So I I hadn't seen it in a few years. That was the first time I saw it was like when I was like 19. But like, <laughs> okay. as I've been watching it over the years, and I hadn't seen it in like, I think two or three years mm. before watching it for this. But I was like laughing out loud. I was like, oh my gosh, look at me laughing out loud in this film. <laughs> like, so anyway, um, I definitely appreciate it more now. I love this movie now. It's my mother-in-law's favorite movie because she loves Tim Curry. Yes. So <laughs> her and I like bond over Tim Curry movies. And this is one of her favorites. So yeah. I like it now. <laughs> nice. And Abby? You've seen the light. <laughs> I've seen the light. <laughs> um, Let's see. I saw this movie probably back in eighth grade. Mm-hmm. So long time ago. My sister's friend introduced her to it. And then she was like, Abby, you have to watch this movie. It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I watched it. Then I showed it to all of my high school friends. And yes. we would like constantly quote it. And like, <laughs> yes, it's so quotable. The flames yes. part, like the flames on the sides of my face. And like <laughs> how Mrs. Peacock talks about the soup. Oh my, the soup's delicious. Oh, yeah. Like <laughs> that was one that we would constantly say to each other. So it was a lot of fun basically, when I saw it, but it's been a favorite of mine for a very long time. Mrs. Peacock is the, and the reason I say I like her the most is because, so it's a movie where every character, every actor is always in character doing their thing. And so in every shot, if this character is not the focus of the shot, they're trying to pull focus. Yes. And (laughs) and Eileen Brennan, who is, and we'll talk about her situation, like when we get into the production of this film, because she was uh, kind of out of rehab, but she is her faces. She, she oh made my God. God. I know. the, the yes. gays. The gays wish they had this. <laughs> like, her faces are so good. <laughs> yeah, I, yes. I think one of the new things that I've discovered is that this film is endlessly quotable, but it's also endlessly gifable because the reaction oh shots God. are really just doing this, God's work in this yes. movie. This yes. film was made to be gift for sure. <laughs> And yes. Joe, what about you, Joe, though? Because, I mean, we've talked about Clue a lot and how much we love it, but I don't think I know your connection to this film. No, the weird thing is, is that I'm very similar to Gracie. I can't for the life of me remember the first time I saw this. I just feel like it's always been in my life. Like, this and Airplane are films that my parents showed me. They kind of said... All of the movies that you watch that are supposedly funny are garbage. Let us show you movies that are legitimately clever and funny. And it was like, oh, oh, damn. Yeah, you're right. Yes. Oh, my God. Oh, incredible. Like, Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, ain't got a candle to... To Clue. (laughs) So I I used to always... I had a great aunt and great uncle that lived in Lake Charles. This is not a long story, I promise. Um, In Lake Charles, Louisiana. And I remember going there and like my grandma was there and like we went to blockbuster and i i was probably around eight or nine years old maybe 10 and mm-hmm. i saw clue and i was like oh like the game i didn't know they made a movie of clue and i remember my yeah. grandma looking at it she picked up the box she looks at it and she goes i don't know you might think this is kind of boring and for a child maybe uh, well, it, entirely <laughs> possible i don't honestly don't really i definitely didn't catch all the the puns when i was a kid no yeah but, but it was the aspect of the murder mystery that appealed to me the most. So mm-hmm. I, I don't mm-hmm. remember if I laughed a lot, but I do remember being invested in, like, like trying to piece together the murder mystery. And, oh, my God. <laughs> but, yes. but I, I know, An I impossible know. impossible task. Which of the three? <laughs> well, and that's the thing, too, because, you know, when it airs, like, obviously outside of the theatrical release, like, it airs the endings, like, in ABC, like, in order. And I remember the first ending, and then it does the whole, oh, like, that's how it could have ended, but how about this? And I was like, what? what? I know. <laughs> Mind blown. (laughs) It's amazing because I was trying to think if there's any other example that I know of that has done this. And I think the only contemporary example is Unfriended Dark Web, where they had two different endings. But I think apart from that, it's like, oh, they tried it with Clue. It didn't work. And Mm. they never did it again. Or it's like the choose your own endings or choose your own adventure books. Oh, I guess there is Bandersnatch, the Black Mirror show. This was sort of like a theater gimmick. And I don't feel like theater gimmicks weren't even really a thing in the 80s, right? That was more of a William Castle thing, wasn't it? Yeah. So I don't know if even that generation, they were probably like, what the fuck is this? Like, like, where's the 3D? (laughs) Well, 
I mean, everyone was busy doing drugs in the 80s. That, that's why it didn't work. <laughs> you mean half this cast? Huh? Half of this cast. Um, no, I, I don't know that ever. But, you know, we'll have some cocaine anecdotes. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta. It's the 80s. <laughs> yes. But Clue is such a brand. I mean, like, I played the game growing up. I'm 100% a cheater. I am the guy that will be like, oh, I have to go pee. And I'll walk to the bathroom and like, look, look at everyone's at people's cards. cards. 100%. No. But, no, but, but they also had Clue books, like for elementary school kids when I was a kid. And so you could read it. You read the book. and It was a different mystery each time, but with the same cast and the same concept of who killed Mr. Body. Oh, weird. Yeah, but yeah. And so it, it would be like, oh, like, turn the page to find the answer to the mystery. But you could try to piece it together beforehand. So I was very... Very much into Clue before I knew this movie existed, which is why when I saw it at Blockbuster, I was like, holy fuck, how have I not heard of this? Wow, I had no idea about those books. Mm -hmm. I didn't either. So I'm actually just remembering that I think my introduction (laughs) to this in part, so my parents had... They were the VCR generation, so we had a VCR version of this. Not like the movie, but we had the board game... You know, Nightmare oh, the Game, where you had like yes. the VHS tape that you would play and it mm-hmm. would play as you played the board game. We had the clue version of that. Oh, oh retro. Oh my God, that's yeah. amazing. Cool. The only problem is, is that I fucking suck at clue. So I would always just want to watch the tape and not play the game because I could never figure out who the killer was. That's why you gotta oh cheat. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 Don't play games with me. I, I'm a really sore loser and I'm a really bad winner, so it's not really fun to play with me either way. Oh, no. <laughs> you just get him a drink and set him off in the corner. <laughs> and just keep telling Trace, Trace, you won. I did. Yep, you did. Yeah, like, how's it going to be? Losers, losers. <laughs> <laughs> Trace, go outside. Go outside. Anyway. Oh, my God. I'm glad. So we're all on the same page with this, with this film. Um, listeners, I mean, by all means, like, hopefully y'all are on the same. I, I, I don't know if I know anyone that hasn't seen this film and granted you know whatever i actually had a friend in college too where he somehow got a bootleg copy of the audio of this movie and burned it onto a cd and he would play the audio of the movie in his car when he was driving what (laughs) that is so cute (laughs) just to listen to it and i wonder if you can catch the wordplay better that way I don't think so. Oh, I so. bet you can. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, <laughs> I watched this with subtitles and I was still missing jokes no. all the time. <laughs> I mean, again, like however many times we've all seen this film, every time I caught a joke last night that I had never heard before. And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. shit. <laughs> Wait, which one? I'm curious. It was the it was thanks to subtitles, but it was whenever Plum was saying, you know, he works for the United Nations organization, uh, which is a part of the World Health Organization, which if you abbreviate it, it's U-N-O-W-H-O, you know who. Yes. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. I did not <laughs> you get know that. who. <laughs> um and there's also like, like Mr. Body is played by Lee Ving, the actor, and there's a whole line where it's like, oh Mr. Body will be leaving soon. And so it's a play on the actor's name. Yes. And oh he's in god. that he's in the band Fear, right? Am I am I right with that? I think he's in like this punk band called Fear, or he was. Yes. What? That's the reason he was cast against the director's wishes. Oops. <gasps> well, I didn't know that. <laughs> Wow. Oh no! Oh, that's a perfect segue, y'all. So let's, okay, here we yes. go. Oh my god! Let's discuss how this film got made because honestly, the Blu-ray is bare bones, um, and there's also reason of well, some reasoning for that. Boo! Where's my <laughs> fucking deluxe treatment? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we will not be getting it um, because the, uh, par- the dire- when the Blu-ray was coming out, the director messaged Paramount and said, hey, like you're doing a Blu-ray. Would you like me to do it? And they said no. Oh, my God. <gasps> what the fuck? Why? What the hell? He thought he didn't know why. They didn't give him a reason. But he was like, I think because this is back in like 2012, I think he was like, I think that they didn't think the home video market was really going anywhere. So they didn't want to spend money to pay me to go do a commentary oh. for this film. Oh, oh my God. God. So... Anyway, um, okay, so everyone, y'all, and listeners, all of this information is actually coming from a really in-depth piece from BuzzFeed, which honestly was shocking to me. Um, but it was, <laughs> it's, from, it's from 2013, and it is a piece by Adam B. Very called The Crazy Story of How Clue Went from Forgotten Flop to Cult Triumph. So, getting this film off the ground, let's, let's talk about this director, Jonathan Lynn, who hasn't really done a ton of movies because he was put in movie jail after this movie. Boo. Oh. Outside of My Cousin Vinny. My Cousin Vinny is the one where he like got another chance and he was like, there you go. That movie is so good, though. Mm-hmm. That movie's also a classic. It's yeah. so funny. It's another one that's just like so 
quotable. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, oh, don't I, little dear? Oh my god, I could go on for days. <laughs> <laughs> So, Jonathan Lynn, the writer and director of this film, his first success was in television um, in a, on a TV show called Yes Minister, which was a, uh, a political satire in the early 80s. So if we have any British listeners, um, I don't know, let us know if you are familiar with this show. Oh, it's super fucking famous and very funny. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> So by the end of 1983, Lynn, who at the time was a former actor turned theater director and obviously TV scribe, he was hitting something of a career high after the show's three-season run. So his agent informed him that hotshot Hollywood producer Peter Goober, who had produced a bunch of films, but most notably, and this will play a part here, An American Werewolf in London. Oh, okay. Mm, it's all coming together. Mm. I did say, I was picking up, there's a bunch of weird connections between this film and horror like mm-hmm. proper horror. So yes. I love that. Yes. So this guy, this Mr. Goober, he is in London. He wants to have breakfast with Jonathan Lamb. And at their meeting, he's like, oh, he didn't even beat around the bush. He was like, I have the perfect movie for you. We're going to do Clue. And <laughs> Lynn was like, wait, it's a board game. It has no story. What the fuck am I supposed to do with this? And the reasoning is because John Landis, the director of An American Werewolf in London, he was the one who was, like, trying to get this off the ground, was like, I'm going to direct this, I have a concept in mind, just hire the writer. And he had Lynn in mind at this point. We'll go back in time a little bit. Right. Also important to note, uh, at this time, Jonathan Landis is also embroiled in a legal battle following the uh, tragic accident that happened on the set of the Twilight Zone movie in which actor Vic Morrow oh. and two children were killed in a helicopter accident. Yep, yeah. yep, yikes. Dang. Yeah, keep that in the back of your mind while we're doing this. So, he and producer Deborah Hill, and of course, everyone may know Deborah Hill as Halloween. Yes. Yeah, I, this was the mm-hmm. first time I realized that she was involved with this film. Yes. Mm-hmm. I was like, yes, girl, oh my god. Without <laughs> Deborah Hill, this film would not have gotten made. Uh, I mean, and also amazing. insert 10 other fantastic, amazing movies. Oh, yes. And Deborah Hill yes. is a goddess. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, R.I.P. So Goober is like, hey, Lynn, like, you know, go, come come to L.A., talk to Landis, talk to Hill, like, let's do it. And he's like, okay, fine, I'll hear. So Landis had already worked out a major outline of the whodunit plot. He acted it all out for Lynn by careening out of the office, jumping up and down on the furniture. It was a real Tom Cruise on Oprah situation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm actually just picturing him doing, like, Wadsworth's final act thing. Like, let me walk your eyes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the thing is, he was doing that, but the problem is he had the movie planned out up until the ending start. He had no idea how to do the ending. Right. Oh. Which was an issue with former writers as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, I mean, Landis had apparently been giving this pitch for a few years. Um, and when Deborah Hill, who was the one who got the movie rights to begin with, you know, she approached Landis about directing the movie. He was like, fuck yeah. But yeah, as I said, he couldn't figure out the ending. So we have a couple stops here to make. And there's there's about five, but I'm only going to do two of them. So <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> he first turned to playwright Tom Stoppard, who worked on a script for Clue for a full year. He hit a wall and was like, I can't figure it out. And he sent the script back and says, here you go. Here's the money you paid me to write the script because I can't do it. What a gentleman. Oh, well, good on him, I suppose. I know. Yeah. But here's the fun one. Stop number two was a writing duo of one Stephen Sondheim, the musical mm-hmm. theater maestro. <gasps> Can totally what? see it. Can totally see it. But get this. His writing partner was one Anthony Perkins, a.k.a. Psycho himself. Yes. Oh, my lord. Oh, my god. So they wrote a movie. That he, uh, Landis was a big fan of their 1973 Hollywood pastiche murder mystery called The Last of Sheila, which I had never heard of, but Landis calls it Bitchery of a High Level, Yes. As are Stephen Sondheim <laughs> and Anthony Perkins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is also kind of a subtitle for this movie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but also, Amazing. don't y'all want to watch don't y'all want to watch The Last of Sheila now? Because bitchery of a high level in the 70s written by Stephen Sondheim and T- Anthony Perkins, like what? <laughs> Yes. My eyes and brain are ready to consume it. That's amazing. <laughs> so they were super game, but asked for a lot of money. And Paramount like, was like, yeah. who the fuck do you think you are? No. Uh, there's Stephen Sondheim and Anthony <laughs> fucking Perkins. Give no, them the like, goddamn the money. 
<laughs> so five writers later, Landis brings in Lynn because he's like, oh, I love Yes Minister. Let's do it. So over the next six months, Lynn worked on the script back home in England, sorting out how to craft a reasonably coherent story out of all the elements. You know, we knew we had to have the color based character names, the murder, the six murder weapons, the multi room mansion, the secret passages, all of it, which don't y'all think like this movie Let's add in video games to this mix, you know, in terms of how close you're adapting a board game or video game or whatever, this movie nails every aspect of this board game. It truly does. It's kind of amazing, actually. Like, ugh. Yeah, I think they, don't they show every single room that's on the board game, right? Yeah. I think mm-hmm. they go into every room and of course there's the weapons and the yes. characters. Yep. It's so funny that you were saying that they had a hard time getting a plot figured out because Mm -hmm. i feel like you have a setting you have characters you might not have like motivation but you have a victim you have all of this stuff lined up for you and i mean yeah you have to like figure out a plot and listen it's like not easy i get it but (laughs) i just feel like you have a lot of things to go off of here and and i mean this is very agatha christie like closed circle Mm exactly yes so i think as long as i mean I don't know. I feel like a lot of it is already given to them. So I'm I'm shocked to hear that they had a hard time figuring out the plot. Seriously, you could get like any D&D nerd <laughs> on board <laughs> and be like, yeah. I'll write this story. It's all here. <laughs> it's all here. Everything I need is here to make a story. So that it's kind of shocking to me that they had a hard time because, yeah, setting characters, the victim, the weapons, it's all there. You just got to figure out the why. Like, so. It's not Monopoly. It's not Sorry. It's not Trouble. Like, right? there is- it's, it's yeah. not Battleship. <laughs> Which I heard. I heard they were trying to make a Monopoly movie and I was like, what are you doing? You what the stop. hell? That sounds stop. so boring. It sounds terrible. <laughs> Listen, we live a Monopoly movie every single day in this goddamn capitalistic society. I don't need a movie about it. <laughs> exactly. It's called like a Monopoly 2021. Uh, Jeff Bezos story. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. So but the the issue wasn't just the ending, though, because Landis's main mandate was we have to have four different endings and we're going to put those endings into separate movies and release them separately in theaters. And the idea was, of course, for box office. Oh, people will go see it. They'll love it. They'll want to go get another ending and go back and see it again. So they were like, mm-hmm. we can quadruple our box office by doing oh my this. God. Oh, I wow. love the ambition, and it's so naive and idealistic. I know, like, I'm like, in baby, retrospect, no. you're like, oh, you poor things. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Who wants to tell them? <laughs> because what really happened is the audience didn't, like, they decided they didn't know which ending to go to, and so instead of picking one to go to, they just didn't go at all. Mm. Oh, too many options. It's like when you scroll through Netflix for like two hours. And yeah. You're like, there's too many. I yes. can't yeah. pick. I think I heard like if you have more than 12 options, you just give up. There's, you can't do it. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, but anyway, so halfway through 84, and this is while Landis is filming a movie called Into the Night with Michelle Pfeiffer and Jeff Goldblum, and he's also, you know, about to stand trial for these, uh, this Twilight Zone thing. Oh my god. <laughs> Just like as an afterthought. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, b- b- because this will actually play a part in the casting at some point, which I just think is really odd, but <gasps> give, give me a second. Okay, so, okay. Lynn finished the screenplay, and he decided to set it in New England in 1954. He was drawing heavily from his friendships with screenwriters who had been blacklisted during the McCarthy era. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that, too. Yes, 100%. I mean, you know, he made color-based pseudonyms, which that honestly is kind of the stroke of genius for me. I remember being a kid and being like, well, Miss Scarlet's not wearing red, and Miss Peacock's not wearing blue. Yeah. But they fixed it with their cars. All of their cars are their colors. <gasps> oh, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> You know, and they got the plot figured out. Um, and not only did the script satisfy all of Landis's requirements, it was teeming with screwball one-liners and rapid-fire repartee. So the only snag was this. In the time it took Lynn to write this script, Landis had agreed to direct the Cold War comedy Spies Like Us, starring Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd. So he couldn't direct the movie. Mm. Also, never heard of that movie. <laughs> uh, weirdly enough, it got really bad reviews when it came out and has since become a cult classic. I just, I also have never heard of this movie. <laughs> yeah, what? Okay. I definitely heard of it, uh, but I did not realize it did not do well because I feel like I know people who really love it. Uh, okay. it, yeah. it did well financially. It did not do well critically. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. 
So he was like, hey, Jonathan Lynn, like, do you want to do this? And to be honest, he didn't really want to do it because he was like, I, I'm a writer. I'm not really a film director. But right. when someone offers you this, you don't say no. So he said yes. Right. I mean, right. I don't blame him. You gotta. I know. <laughs> So Landis basically, he stays on as executive producer, but he disappears to go do Spies Like Us. And we move into casting. So let's start with Wadsworth. Their first choice was Leonard Rossiter. He's known for a lot of stage, but he'd done Oliver and Barry Lyndon in film. But while they were seeking him out, he actually died during the production. (laughs) Oh (laughs) Oh my god, that sucks. That does suck. There was a production of a play called Loot, and he was literally waiting to walk on stage for his part, and he died backstage. <gasps> oh, wow. What the? Such an actor, though. What a mm-hmm. way to go. Oh, my Doing God. What he loved. <laughs> Choice number two was a then relatively unknown in the States, Rowan Atkinson, a.k.a. Mr. Bean. Yes. I totally oh, see it. A hundred percent. Oh, my God. <laughs> he would have been so good. The reason I didn't work out is because Paramount was like, we don't know him. America doesn't know him. We can't do that. <gasps> Oh, right. oh my god. <laughs> we don't know British people. Never mind that the writer director is a British person. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Like, I'm sure, like, he thought of him because he's also British. And so yeah. he was like, oh, what about Rowan? And they're like, who? Yep. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, he uh, would have been great. Oh, oh, well. Yeah. And so they, they got Curry because of Rocky Horror. Like, that was right. basically like, they were like, oh my god, yeah, well, let's do that. And they, he was high profile enough for Paramount to be like, yeah, sure, that's fine. Right. Which is ironic because Rocky Horror was a huge fucking flop until it became a midnight sensation. I was just going to say, yeah, that's so weird. (laughs) Well, it's funny, right? Because now Curry has two of these like films that were flops and became huge cult hits that everyone quotes and does midnight showings of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. So basically bet on Tim Curry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If it's not a success now, it will be in 20 years. Oh, right. Right. So yes. next up is Eileen Brennan as Mrs. Peacock. So this is actually one of her first projects after a six-week stint at the Betty Ford Center for Addiction to Painkillers because she was in a car accident two years prior and Aww. became addicted. Aww. Oh, that poor lady. Yeah. Apparently she had, she was still like physically like suffering. And so the scenes when she's running around back and forth with the cast, like she was struggling. And Christopher <sighs> Lloyd has a quote where he's like, you could see her, but she's a trooper. She's a professional. So she didn't even like say anything about it. And you also yeah. cannot tell on screen because she I is keeping up with would've. everybody. <laughs> I never yes. would have known. Yeah. Christopher Lloyd, not yet being in Back to the Future, because I think that would come out either like the next year or something. But he was only really known for being in Taxi. So they got him for that. So they got him for cheap. <laughs> yes. Uh, Michael McKean is Mr. Green. I, I always forget he's on Laverne and Shirley. Yes. Uh, right. Oh, okay. my God. Yeah. So sitcom actor again, but also this mm-hmm. is Spinal Tap was what he was known for. So he was probably the biggest heavy hitter for the men outside of Tim Curry. Mm. Okay. Uh, Martin Mull was really only known for Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, a very funny soap opera from the 70s. Mm-hmm. But that's Corona Mustard. Mrs. White had somehow come out underwritten in the first draft of the film, but Madeline Kahn had expressed interest. So Lynn enthusiastically wrote more material for the character. So oh, imagine. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I have a lot to say about the women in this film. So oh, they, they they carry on their backs. The men are one hundred percent. But <laughs> this is oh a woman God. dominated film. One hundred percent. Oh my yeah. gosh, for sure. Okay, sorry. I just got super excited. No. <laughs> <laughs> so here's where this little bit of uh, John Landis trivia comes in. So Colleen Camp for Yvette, she had to fight for this role because um, Jonathan Landis didn't really want her. People like Madonna and Demi Moore were interested, as was uh. Jennifer Jason Lee. And oh, no. could totally see it. <laughs> but here's the thing, and, and this is why I bring up the Twilight Zone issue. Jennifer Jason Lee's father was Vic Morrow. I was going to say Vic Morrow. Yeah, she's probably like, fuck this movie. Fuck you. (laughs) Yeah. And so, yeah, so literally she's like trying to get a role in this movie that would have been directed by the man who was on trial for possibly murdering her father. Oh, so the drama. Holy cats. Also, that makes it seem like Hollywood is comprised of about 10 people. Like, (laughs) what are the odds? (laughs) That's the end of that. So, I mean, yeah, if y'all want to know more about that accident, like, go, it's all over Wikipedia. Like, yeah, it's super all. sad. I think there's, like, yeah. a whole episode dedicated to it in that Shudder uh, series, right? Yes. There is, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yep. Curse, yep. Curse Films, I think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. As I said, the studio wanted leaving. Lynn did not, but he was like, ooh, I've said no to every single thing Paramount has asked of this movie, so I better <laughs> give them one thing. <laughs> I guess they gave me my multiple endings. I'll take this random hot dude, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
are y'all ready for the dirt on this now? Oh, I'm so ready. Yes. yes. We've left off one character, and that is Miss Scarlet. Mm-hmm. For Miss Scarlet, the film had its big get, and that was Carrie Fisher, Princess mm-hmm. Leia herself. Yes. Yeah. A week before rehearsals were supposed to start, Ling got a call saying that Fisher was in rehab, mainly for cocaine use. Mm. Fisher said, oh, no, it's totally fine. I'll be at the rehab facility. They'll let me out during the day. I will shoot my scenes and I will come back at night and stay at the rehab facility. It's like, baby, no, that's not how rehab (laughs) works. Oh, honey. (laughs) So Lynn goes to Deborah Hill. Deborah Hill's like, yeah, it's fine. Okay. Then he goes to Paramount Pictures head Don Steele, who goes, yeah, it's fine. Oh my gosh. Everybody's like, we really, really fucking want Carrie Fisher Seriously? in this movie. Seriously? Yeah. So Lynn, in this interview from 2013, he was like, I honestly think that like Fisher, Deborah Hill, and Don Steele were like cocaine buddies. He was like, I was very naive. I didn't know everyone in Hollywood was snorting cocaine all the time. But that honestly is, 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 is what I gather was happening. <laughs> Oh my oh god. No. Can you imagine? We're just like sullying the good reputation of all of these people. Like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh my god. So, what happened was that the insurance company was like, Are y'all fucking kidding? No. Like, she cannot. <laughs> So this is when they turned to Leslie Ann Warren, who had recently earned an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actress for her performance in the musical Victor Victoria. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing her on a rerun of that Cinderella musical. Oh, yes, that's how I knew her! Yes, oh that's God. how I knew her, too. And I was like, <laughs> this is Cinderella, what the heck? <laughs> Wait, oh my God! Did you just realize? <laughs> yes! Whereas I'm just like, oh, isn't she Susan, a.k.a. Terry Hatcher's mom on Desperate Housewives? <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> oh, my God. And granted, I think that Leslie M. Warren is great in this role. She is, I mean, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm making rankings of the performances, she is my least favorite of the women. But, like, mm. she gets more to do than, honestly, than Christopher Lloyd or Professor Plum or uh, Martin Muldoo. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But, I mean, imagine, you know, imagine Carrie Fisher in this role and how different that might have been. I think the character would have come off a lot more acerbic. Like, Mm -hmm. I think Leslie Ann Warren plays her as sexy. And I think Carrie Fisher would have been sexy, but like with a lot more bite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. So, okay. We got all that set. Clue was filmed on a soundstage at Paramount Pictures uh, in Hollywood from November to December of 1984. All interior scenes come to the Paramount lot, with the exception of the ballroom scene and the gateway exteriors in the driveway. That's filmed in a mansion in South Pasadena, which ate up $1 million of the film's $8 million budget. Holy (laughs) jumping. That is not a good use of their money, because (laughs) that comprises, what, maybe 10 seconds of footage of this movie? Yeah, like, what the fuck? Maybe they they were like, we need the right atmosphere. (laughs) I do want to point out that this article says the budget was $8 million, but Box Office Mojo said it was $15 million. I hmm. feel like that prob- the $15 million probably includes marketing. Okay, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, okay. marketing or inflation, like what? But Yeah. Okay. I could see 15 for this, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just think with the cast. Yeah. But, I don't know, who knows? Well, maybe, but- maybe they got all the TV actors for a song. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, nothing really else with the production. I mean, like, it actually wasn't really an improv-heavy set because Lynn didn't like improv. The only big example of improv, of course, is Madeline Kahn's infamous flame speech. Mm-hmm. The funny anecdote I saw is that he, the costume designer was really intent on having them in period-accurate clothing, so the women all had to wear, like, these really tight corsets to the point where Leslie M. Morgan couldn't even sit down. She had to... <gasps> oh. um. They had to bring in, oh, I forgot what the thing was called, but they had to bring in basically a wooden board that would lean against a wall and it had armrests on it. So she could lean on it, but she could not actually sit down because she didn't have the give. Okay, so I feel like you can actually see that in certain scenes. There's a moment where she sits on a desk and you can tell that she's barely (laughs) able to stay upright. Yes! And I definitely always thought that it was just, like, the fit of the dress. Me too. Mm. I thought she's worried that that thing is going to fall off. And so she's just trying to move a certain way so it doesn't... So her nips aren't exposed. I mean, there are boobs everywhere in this movie. Oh my god, (laughs) She's wearing that dress, like, in Showgirls Joe. uh, The the woman who, like, does the arm thing and her her tits pop out. (laughs) Big mama? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Mama baboom. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Only get my tits to work. Um, okay, so Clue was released theatrically on December 13th, 1985. 
Each theater received one of three endings, and some theaters announced which ending the viewer would see, but some did not. So the final like, gross... How does that work? Like, we've got ending A, or we've got ending B, or like, we've got the ending where Miss Scarlet did it. It's A, B, C. Okay. ABC. And I think some newspapers would say that. Um, and a big, and we'll get to this in a bit, but the, a big issue is too for the critic screenings, they didn't tell them like what ending was what. So critics had to go and hunt for the different endings of this movie uh, in order to see it. Uh, that's a, that was a huge mistake. They should have just had a private screening for mm-hmm. critics and they should have had all three endings. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, that's that was such a, a bad mistake on their part. And yeah. I think that's what played a part of the bad reviews. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe, because you're going to give us some quotes, mm-hmm. and honestly, I feel like these critics didn't even watch the movie, because their reactions are so polar opposite to what everybody else is seeing. Mm-hmm. Huh. So it opens in the number six slot with $2 million, and it goes on to gross $14.6 million in North America, just short of, again, I'm thinking a $15 million budget after marketing. So nevertheless, this movie did not make its money back. It mm-hmm. did flop. Why Oof. is that? So. Let's start with one. The movie was one of several films and was late in the game, made and released between the mid-70s and mid-80s that revived the old Dark House Mansion movie. Huh, that one sounds familiar. Yes, yeah. exactly. So we've got um, oh, 1976's Murder by Death, which also starred Eileen Brennan. I low-key love that movie, oh, even it's... though it's so freaking racist. I love it, though. I love it. It's so bad, though, but it's so funny. God. <laughs> Have you seen this one, Joe? Uh, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. It's oh, got Maggie God. Smith and Truman Capote in it. Oh, th- okay. That's why I know it, because of Truman Capote. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, there's 1975 Spiral Staircase, 1980's The Private Eyes, Cat in the Canary in 78, House of Long Shadows in 83, Bloodbath at the House of Death in 84. These are all before Clue came out. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if it was genre fatigue. Right. Oh, oh yeah. wow. I never thought of that. Yeah. Which is hilarious because we don't ever get these kinds of movies. Like, remember when the terrible murder on the Orient Express comes out and everybody's losing their shit? It's like, don't. this isn't even oh a good movie. God. I, I like know. it. I like it. No, it's no, good. Trace. <laughs> it's awful, Trace. Just get accept it. This is our podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> Just get because it has here. famous people doesn't make it good. Death yes. on the Nile comes out like, well, I mean, maybe maybe next year. Who knows when Death maybe. on the Nile comes out? But we're getting oh, a sequel. No. <laughs> we gotta get rid of Army oh. Hammer first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> but critics also did hate this so you know janet mass of the new york times here's some examples uh the beginning is the only part of the film that is remotely engaging after that it begins to drag there is not much wit to be found in this movie what I are just... you <laughs> shitting <Can't. me? laughs> the beginning is the slowest part yeah the beginning makes you think that it's actually a mystery and then the rest of the movie is all wit i'm sorry yeah. Jenny. janet you're wrong <laughs> i love your opinion but you're wrong i know <laughs> like what you thought the dog shit was the most engaging part <laughs> I do love that gag, though. No! <laughs> I know, that was so funny. Are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, but it's not the smartest joke. No, no. No! Um, Gene Siskel gave it a two and a half out of four, saying it offers a few big laughs early on, followed by a lot of characters running around on a treadmill to nowhere. Roger Ebert gave the film two out of four, saying that it has a promising cast, but the screenplay is so very, very thin that the actors spend most of their time looking frustrated as if they'd just been cut off right before they were about to say something interesting. And he what? also said there is not much fun to be had in this movie. What? <sighs> you know what? <laughs> <laughs> Go fuck yourself, basically. <laughs> so that being wow. said i mean like reviews have gotten better you know we're looking at a 66 percent on rotten tomatoes with an average score of 6.1 out of 10 metacritic it has a 39 out of 100 whoa, whoa. yeah it's only 11 reviews though and i bet you they're all like back from back then right okay yeah mm-hmm. yeah letterbox we're looking at a 7.4 out of 10 and lynn does think that the multiple endings you know is the big issue He lays the blame for the film's failure to connect. Oh, um, so yeah, not only did critics hate the idea, but Paramount bungled uh, informing the film critics which ending corresponded to the letters. But he also thinks that the, uh, it was a botched marketing gimmick. Uh, He said it was something just that was too complex. People were like, well, do I need to go see it three times? I don't know. Blah, 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 blah. So again, as we said, people just didn't go see it because they were too confused. Right. Hmm. Uh, Hmm. It kind of reminds me of like the old House of Wax. Oh, how yes. like when it came out it had like the 3d gimmicks mm-hmm. but when you see it now you're like 
why the fuck am I staring at this man, like, flinging a ping pong ball in my face <laughs> for, like, 45 seconds? Yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, or why are these, like, dancers, like, pushing their butts into the camera? I remember being a kid and being like, <laughs> yeah. why are they doing this? <laughs> You're like, wow, this is really saucy for an old movie. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, for the, it was for the gimmick, you know? Exactly. And it, it sucks, right, though? Because who, I mean, well, actually... It sucks at the time, but I mean, honestly, it kind of works out because the film is so popular now. And I don't know mm-hmm. if it would have had that if it, I don't know, if, uh, who knows? Who knows what would have happened if it was a box office success? Also, right. this film is super short. Yeah. It's only an yeah. hour and a half. And I feel like if you're missing two of those endings, it doesn't end well. Like if you're only seeing one of those endings, I think if you see the final ending, which you know, the mm-hmm. one that quote unquote really happened, I think mm-hmm. that is the strong to me personally, I think that's the strongest ending. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If you're just seeing the Miss Scarlet one, which is also good, like, mm-hmm. but it's not as strong. And unfortunately, the Mrs. Peacock one oh, is I think also that one's bad. Yeah, that one is not good. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and that one is super weak, I I feel like. So I feel like if you're not, if you see just one of those, your movie is also going to be kind of short, really. You kind of need those, that extra like five or ten minutes, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Yep. I will say, I do think the last one's the best. Um, There is an option in the Blu-ray where you can do it where they show you all three or they will pick a random one for you. Oh, that's mm-hmm. cool. Yes. Okay. Yep. So my only issue with that last ending, and we'll talk about this as we get into the queer stuff, but like. Mm. That undoes Mr. Yeah. Green's I was queerness, gonna say, yep. Whereas yes. neither of the other two innings do that. But also the third inning is the only one with the flame speech. So yes. without the flame speech, like <laughs> Can you imagine yeah. not getting the flame speech? <laughs> oh my god. I actually had that when I rewatched it because I, I chose to watch all three endings as I always do, but we got through the first two endings and I thought, oh fuck, did I miss the flame speech? Like, did I go to the yeah. bathroom and not realize that I was missing it? And then it's like, oh fuck, it's in an ending. Yeah, so some, a whole bunch of people probably never got this and yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Oh my god, and Madeline Kahn was probably like, that was like my greatest moment. <laughs> it truly was. I'm going to be gift for this, even though I don't know what that means. I know. <laughs> Uh, so I mean yeah so Lynn goes to director jail he he does some comedy in the early 90s then he does My Cousin Vinny um, he didn't really do much after that but, the, but he did a movie called The the Fighting Temptations with Beyonce and Cuba oh, Gooding yeah. Jr yeah, yeah. wow and Joe this might sound familiar because of student bodies but it's around you know the 90s and the early 2000s that Clue starts becoming a staple for basic and pay cable programs mm-hmm. eager to fill in non-peak time slots with cheap movies yeah there's no profanity in this movie. There's no sex. There's no mm-hmm. gore. This is an easy, like, let's put it on TV movie. And mm-hmm. I actually didn't watch this movie. I mean, I rented this movie a lot, so I never saw this on t- on cable. This was not one of those for me. Hmm. I never saw it on cable either. Like, mm-hmm. the fact that I, I didn't see it till I was in college is kind of surprising to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Saw it on a good old-fashioned DVD. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have that bare bones. I mean, lit- literally. So, yeah, Paramount has yet to capitalize on the film's rabid fan base. In 2011, I'm sorry, the studio's home video division released a Blu-ray edition of the film with zero special features, except the three endings are listed as a special feature, by the way. Balls. That is such <laughs> horseshit. <laughs> and yeah, uh, Lynn had his agents and manager call Paramount, and they said, uh, no, we uh, we don't want to do any extra features for this Blu-ray. <gasps> Makes <sighs> sense. Thanks for ruining my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, also because I, I, Eileen Brennan was alive by the point this Blu-ray came out, so we don't have her anymore. Right. Madeline oh, Kahn had died already, but right. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so sad, though. Mm-hmm. You know. But um, but yeah, so that, that that is the making of Clue. I, I I normally don't go that long in the production history, but I was just like, holy shit. Like, that's I can't saucy. not say this stuff. <laughs> I know. Yeah, lots of drama. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, let's maybe talk about the drama that's contained within the, I mean, I feel like I need to use air quotes, narrative. Uh, I I do have (laughs) almost two pages of plot in this, but I'm just like, I'm missing all of the movie just by talking about it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So let me give it a go. So our story is set, as Trey said, in New England in 1954. That year will be important. We'll talk about it in a bit. But Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're introduced to Wadsworth the butler, who is played by Tim Curry. And he checks on Yvette the maid, played by Colleen Camp, as well as Miss Ho the cook, who is played by Kelly Nakahara. I never knew her name was Miss Ho, by the way. 
I know. It was like, oh, God bless your <laughs> subtitles. <laughs> I always feel like she's a bit of a weak link. Like, okay, we have two people of color in this entire movie. One is a black police officer, and then we've got our Asian cook. And I don't even know that she gets a line of dialogue. She does. She says, dinner will be ready at 7 p.m. <laughs> <Yep. laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> and that is it. Equity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh it, it's, it's the same number of lines that singing Telegram Lady has, so it's probably fine. Okay, but she's a singer from the Go Go's, so it's not like <laughs> she needs to. <laughs> <laughs> Is she even a singer, or is she just the drummer? Oh, she might be just the drummer. I just oh, know she's God. in the band. <laughs> well, she sings perfectly in this movie. <laughs> she does. It's beautiful. She does a little tap. She gets shot dead. It's one of my favorite fucking parts of this movie. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> because she doesn't even get to do anything, and then she's just dead. You're like, wait, what? Well, but, but that, that's, I know. that's an example of how editing works, though, because we get the gunshot, and then it, it, we don't see the gunshot hit her, but it's like mm-hmm. she just like it's like cuts to her like mid fall. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and then the door just slams, and we don't even care. <laughs> That's honestly generally how I feel about having house guests, so I get it. Yeah, it's like if you're going to ring my doorbell, or if you're going to call me on the phone instead of texting, I'm going to shoot you like the singing telegram girl. Yes. This better be good. <laughs> <laughs> all right so yes we we basically have the arrival of all of these guests and i feel like my key takeaway from this is just that every single guest seems to be obsessed with yvette's boobs when they walk in so they're either paying attention to her or they're staring down her dress every single guest every person mrs peacock I thought it like oh stretches her head out to like practically <laughs> shove it down her cleavage, and <laughs> and then she makes this face like Eileen Eileen her? Brennan is the is the master. It, it, it's it's not quite as good as there as her face whenever uh, uh, Wadsworth says that his wife had friends who were socialists because that that's mm-hmm. that's priceless. <laughs> or when Mister Green says that he's a homosexual and her disgust is just like ten out of ten. Oh my god! Uh, oh. Eileen Bre- Eileen Brennan is serving me in this movie. I just love everything about it. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, <laughs> the recurring gag here is that Wadsworth has stepped in dog poo, and then everybody stops to check their shoe because they worry that they are the ones who stepped in dog poo. And I do think it's funny. I do. Yeah. I wonder if it maybe set some of the critics off on the wrong foot saying, oh, are we just going to get shit jokes in this movie? Oh, yeah. Possibly. I mean, again, I, I mean, I, I'm just imagining Roger Ebert huffing around Chicago to all these different theaters like, okay, is this B? Is this ending B? <laughs> no? God damn it. I gotta write my review. <laughs> um, funnily enough, Siskel and Ebert thought ending A, the Scarlet Dead ending was the best, and the ending C, the one we all like, was mm-hmm. the worst ending. Oh, get oh out of here. God. Just fuck off, both of them. <laughs> oh, shit. Seriously. Seriously, like, way to try to be a contrarian. Get out of here. <laughs> so true. Those two were, honestly. Oh, I But basically the Muppets version of film critics. Like, <laughs> the two dudes up in the balcony. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Thanks, I hated it! <laughs> Uh, okay yeah so they all arrive they kind of quickly realize that none of them really know what the fuck they're doing there they all have pseudonyms that they don't really understand but they're dressed like it's a fancy party so then yes dinner is served at seven so they go into the dining room and wadsworth buttles them in and they have a seat (laughs) i buttle sir (laughs) so they have a dinner of uh shark fin soup Shark fin soup, madame. <laughs> oui, monsieur. <laughs> so, hey, y'all, it's Halloween. We're having fun with this one. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, because no one really knows what to say, we've got Peacock doing her best hostessing <laughs> gig, which is basically just Eileen Brennan talking for 30 seconds without taking a breath. It's glorious. <laughs> It's wonderful. It's so funny. Uh, I laughed so hard watching it this time around. I was like, 
Well, it, it, it's really when she makes that switch to, um, she, oh my, this soup is delicious. I am just mm-hmm. She looks around and everyone is like, lady. Just staring at her. What is her deal? Well, also, we, we have the gag with the slurping too, which is, I guess, yes. on par with the dog shit. But like, that's still really funny. Oh, see, I find that way funnier because it, you expect that Miss White is going to be a proper lady. Yeah. And then, you know, Trace, you and I have talked a million times about how we love so-called proper for women doing either crass or vulgar things and this feels like the g-rated version of that right she doesn't Uh need to cuss up a storm but she is gonna slurp that fucking soup oh (laughs) (laughs) yeah i didn't even think about that but you're totally right and i love you for it (laughs) Uh, so the big thing to come out of the dinner is the fact that they do all have ties to washington and they're being paid by the government so Mm -hmm. mm, they have connections they maybe didn't realize and see this is something that like nine or ten year old trace did not i didn't understand any of this this conversation (laughs) but it also kind of doesn't matter like you just need to know that they're all being blackmailed really at the end of the day you're right but i I really do like hearing like all the different connections because it does make sense in the end which granted Mm -hmm. every time i watch the end of this movie i'm like okay i'm gonna like go with the scarlet ending i'm gonna rewatch up until here and make sure all of this tracks because i'm always Mm -hmm. like every time they find the cook's body i'm like okay who's not here (laughs) yeah i (laughs) never pay attention like who's missing in the background i'm never paying attention Mm -mm. Mm -mm. (laughs) did did y'all the monkey's brains by the way it looks like meringue i don't understand oh my god i know (laughs) yeah i was so i was like oh (laughs) yeah first of all disgusting you're not supposed to eat brains (laughs) second of all it kind of looks like a tasty dessert it looks like an ice cream or something right but looks good what's the proximity between this and the other infamous monkey brains in indiana jones and the temple of doom so i was I yeah. yeah 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 because it looks like the same thing kind of because those brains in that movie actually look pretty good too. So. <laughs> <laughs> we apologize so to any vegans. Oh yeah, listen though, I feel like, and I don't know if this is correct, but is that kind of a racist thing to say? Like yes. this is like a Cantonese a dish, and it's like, but is it? I don't know. Like uh, uh, I don't know. That always kind of made me feel uneasy. I don't know. Yes. I mean, it's the time period, so it's like, whatever, you can't really do anything about that, I suppose. But I just remember watching it this time, and I was like, ooh, I don't know if that was a very good thing to say. But uh, there's, like, that whole thing about how, like, the cook is supposed to be Asian, right? right? And everybody yeah. thinks of Asian food, and they're like, ooh, that's, right. like, weird exactly. and gross, and they eat weird things. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like that, like, you don't really think about it until afterwards and you're like oh shit (laughs) well until they mention it yeah but also miss peacock is later revealed to be taking bribes from international bodies so i think we're Mm -hmm. just meant to assume that she's well traveled and has maybe been to asia um she has a refined palate and i've never had brains but it's 100 percent on my eating bucket list okay then I mean, you can very easily get, like, I think lamb or cow brains. Like, those are relatively common. You know what? I might have eaten a cow brain before. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. I think I should know that. (laughs) My God. Where's my dietary tracker app? Oh, there it is. Brains. Yes. Oh, no. They have those apps for, like, beer, and it's like, but it's brains. But it's it's brains. It's different types of brains. brains, That's right. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so then we get the arrival of Mr. Body, played by Lee Ving, and I'm sorry, that name. Fantastic. But honestly, y'all, he is the least interesting part of this movie. Oh, God, yeah. He actually did decline to participate. He's the only person who declined to participate in this interview for BuzzFeed um, back in 2013. Uh, Mm -hmm. Party pooper. Mm -hmm. I know. So this is when we get the revelation that everyone is being blackmailed from various shady activities. So Plum has sexually assaulted a female patient. Peacock is taking bribes. Scarlet as a madam. Colonel Mustard is one of her clients, but also is later revealed to be a war profiteer. Miss White is obviously a black widow. That's where all of her comedy comes from. And then finally, Mr. Green is a homosexual and proud of it. Mm-hmm. A, I love that Scarlet is like, yeah, fuck it. I did it. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm Adam. Yeah. I'm not going to deny yeah. it. Oh my God. Seriously, I love her. <laughs> um, I don't know who Peacock says it to, but I, I think it's Plum. But when she's like, oh, how disgusting. <laughs> 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 Are you passing moral judgments, Mrs. Peacock? 
<laughs> yes. Honestly, the way she says that, it reminds me of the way that the baby in Who Framed Roger Rabbit talks <laughs> when he's not <laughs> acting like a baby. <laughs> She's got such a, a deep, like, affectation in her vocal mannerisms. Yes. I fucking love it. And she, she gets this other, because I, I say this all the time, but whenever, like, someone's like, oh, is that? She goes, she stands up and goes, no, it's a vicious lie. Oh, I love yes. that. My fa- one of my favorite parts of this film is that, no, it's a vicious lie. And she, like, does, like, a little, like, a little dance, like a step ball change. And then she, like, <laughs> sits down. Uh. Literally. Every good part in this movie involves Mrs. Peacock, (laughs) especially like the part where she's screaming and he's like, I had to stop her screaming. (laughs) Even the physical comedy that later whenever she's about to faint and Wadsworth is like, fall into my arms. Oh, yeah. Uh, I love that gag so much. That one is so good. Even the part where body falls on her and she's screaming, but it also looks like they're dancing. Oh yes! W- w- when she's behind the curtain, having to like prop the cook's <laughs> arms up, but, but she, she makes this like ah sound from behind the curtain. <laughs> I was just going to say I love that part. It's just like, and honestly, I know like okay. So listen, I know like they were saying that like the only improv line I guess mm-hmm. was Mrs. White. Mm-hmm. With the flames thing, but I don't know. Like Mrs. Peacock, obviously, she makes these like Ugh, like those noises, right? <laughs> but yes. but a Mrs. White, Madeline Kahn makes the same noises. And listen, there's this one scene. I'm sorry, we're skipping to no, Mrs. White. No, it's fine. Skip ahead. <laughs> there's this one scene where uh, Mr. Green goes up to her. And yes. He's like, I hate when she oh. does that. And she oh. goes, oh. and she goes, ah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I was like, I I've, I've actually done this in theater in com- in comedies that I've been in, oh. and I feel like that I for sure I know was improv, and I mm-hmm. and I feel like Madeline Kahn, like I I feel I wonder if she did that because I feel like she maybe thought like I'm losing my audience or like right. I gotta like step it up a bit and stuff, and I feel like that all of these women again like we talked about this but they really carry it mm-hmm. they make these like little like the these little noises that mm-hmm. are actually very funny and they engage the audience and they like get the audience to like even just giggle just a little mm-hmm. bit or to like just get involved with the maybe the jokes that are coming by making these like silly little noises that actually are hilarious it's seriously like millennial humor it like, is <laughs> like <laughs> how you Oh, for like sure. How we quote vines and shit all the time, oh. and it's like the most ridiculous stuff. I don't know, like Abby, do you remember like when it was a thing where we would just go mer? Like people would say <laughs> <Yes>. that. <laughs> It's so fucking oh God, weird. I still yes. do that. I still do that. <laughs> it was like a thing where it's like you'd go up to your friend, you go mer, and your friend would go mer, and you would just like talk like that. Oh, see, that's my yes. whiny voice, like because because Amy Schumer has this joke where she's like, "Man, Kevin James won't give me his dick." Man. <laughs> So I think that's why these like little noises that like Mrs. Peacock and Mrs. White make that are like just these like really goofy noises are so funny to me. Oh, yeah. They are so it's so good. I wonder oh if maybe God. that's why Leslie Amorin plays Miss Scarlet a bit straighter. Yeah, mm. she doesn't have those kinds of moments, does she? No, not at all. Granted, more so than them. And I'm not trying to belittle them in here. I th- I think Lloyd Mull and um McKean. holy shit. McKean, I think McKean does the best work out of the man, actually. But um, oh, first, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but maybe it's because I mean, like, because of the gay thing. Like, like he is allowed to be more theatrical, I'll say, um, uh, than, than Lloyd and Mole are in some points. Maybe more like camp. They're able to like have this like campiness that the quote unquote straighter characters really aren't allowed to have. I guess. Mm. Yep. Oh, yeah. I, I I'm not disagreeing with anything right. that you're saying, but I also don't think we're giving Mull quite enough credit mm-hmm. because I think he begins the film very reserved, and as it goes on, we get to see these cracks in Colonel Muster's yeah. facade. Yeah. Like I love the moment where the chandelier falls, and he basically has a heart attack and has he to go and sit down like, in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I, I always true. love his, um, I'm only a guest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it, I feel like what we're actually seeing is it's Lynn saying, no, I don't want any improv because I'm a screenwriter and my words are really yeah. important. Like I've calculated out the jokes. So you're going to deliver them as I say. And then what all the actors do is they say, well, we're going to say them in a funny accent or we're going to do like, Murr. 
<laughs> like they're finding yes. ways to insert their own brands of comedy around it. And I think that's part of why it's so funny because the jokes are witty, but then we also have these weird slapsticky kind of mm-hmm. unexpected affectations. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The yes. Um, when Madeline Kahn like hits her glass against the uh. the fireplace and goes, <laughs> play! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, she definitely like was not told to say it that way. She just no. did it herself. But also, <laughs> the fact that this is mostly like ninety nine percent Lynn's screenplay. I'm like, okay, he mm-hmm. spent six months writing this, but this is an ingenious script. Oh I God. mean, even the double negative running gag that keeps coming back. Yes. And mm-hmm. honestly, I always knew like I-, I knew they were jokes, but I wasn't really because again, the- this movie is so fast. It's like Gilmore mm-hmm. Girls here. But oh, yeah, like, you're missing eight jokes when you laugh at one. Yes. Right. Yes. Yep. But Joe, I'll go back like those subtitles man like uh, oh, reading yeah. the reading the double negative jokes i was mm-hmm. like oh. <laughs> oh my god i know I, I love i love 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 the scene where he's like oh, are you trying to make me look stupid <laughs> and he's like you don't need any help from me that's right okay but i said i've like quoted that scene with a friend before <laughs> like we just did it in public and i think people were like what are these people talking about <laughs> What's wrong with these people? I think she means he threatened in public to yes! kill her. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that is actually one of my favorite jokes in this entire movie. Like that in terms joke? of wordplay, I yes, yes, so funny because it's a grammar joke. People, it is a fucking joke about grammar. Like where mm-hmm. you put the comma matters. Uh, maybe yes. that's the, maybe that's the Britishness of uh, of Lynn too. Like he's really like yeah. it's not. I don't even think this is dry humor, but like it does feel. I don't want to say more intelligent, but it is very smart. It's a very mm-hmm. smart script. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's like, here, let me read you my note. Wadworth proposes they turn the blackmailer in and body counters by giving the weapons from the game. <laughs> it's like the plot is so dry and by the numbers in terms of our murder mystery. But, you know, then we get stuff like Wadsworth being like, your first husband also disappeared, Miss White. But that was his job. He was an illusionist, Wadsworth. But he never reappeared. Well, he wasn't a very good illusionist. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yes. I do love the reveal of these weapons, though, because you get the music here where it's like, dun, dun, dun. Mm-hmm. dun, yes. dun. But like, for all six of them, it's like, do we need this? No. But they're no. like, no, people are, people know this fucking game, man. We yes. got to highlight these weapons. <laughs> well, it, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's fan service. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And this reveal to me is so like again like this campiness of it. It reminded me of a uh, house on haunted yes, hill. Yes, that's a hundred percent. And of course, what I the thought house is is on a hill. It's called Hill House. It's called right? Hill House. Yeah, yeah. So I love that reveal. The, yeah, this movie starts like scary movie too. Um, oh, but God. like it's. But- <laughs> Oh my god! No, but like th- this does play as a spoof of those Agatha Christie type movies oh, yeah. in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yes, for sure. I feel like this is never mentioned in parody or spoof because it's not directly parodying a specific text. It's just the general idea of mm-hmm. this murder mystery in a haunted mansion. Like that. Yeah, this is a, a spoof. It's a spoof. Well, I think it's because it's such a fucking good comedy. Like I said with my parents, they said, oh, Clue and Airplane are just straightforward, the best comedies out there. So (laughs) typically when you think of parodies, you think of films that can't really stand on their own because they have to make fun of other texts. Whereas I would say Mm. Clue is doing both. It's just doing it super fucking well. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very clever in the way that it does it. There is a reason this is one of my top four films on my Letterboxd profile. Yeah. Oh, so good. Wait, what yes. are your other ones? I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's uh, it's Scream 2, Drop Dead Gorgeous, and Romy and Michelle. Listen, yeah. Drop Dead Gorgeous oh. is <laughs> such an amazing <laughs> film. I feel like, Gracie, we're getting a taste of like what you like in terms of comedies, and you like just a little bit of risque content, don't you? <laughs> I do, I think, for sure. <laughs> Yes. And everyone, uh, Drop Dead Gorge is not out of the running for horror queers coverage because it is also a murder mystery. So we're going to count it. Oh my God, yes. So many people die in that. <laughs> it's great. And then you get a Jesus like on the cross oh. dancing scene. Oh my God. Such a good, it's great. And Mama always said, don't eat anything that can take its house where it goes. <laughs> you don't know the last time I got food. Oh my god, Joe, whenever we cover it, we have to just do Minnesota accents the entire time. <laughs> oh, if you don't, I'll be so sad. Oh A-L-A. my god. A. Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. <laughs> We're so terrible at accents, but sure. Bad. <clears throat> um, okay. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so Mr. Body has been murdered, but he wasn't shot, even though we did get a shot in the dark. I feel like we're just going to keep saying it. Oh, it's my favorite joke. But I love where Eileen Brennan takes the sip of brandy and they go, maybe it was poisoned. And mm. she just goes, ah! Oh, <laughs> yes! tr- trust me. One of my favorite Peacock moments is coming up and it is a completely wordless moment. And I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so they end up sitting here on the couch. Yeah, they slap her to calm her down a little bit. Unless she dies too, and then they all just stare at her. Yes. Oh my God. What a bunch of assholes these people are. Oh, it's so <laughs> no, good. for real. Like, imagine it. You're like just sitting there waiting to die pretty much, and everybody's just like, you're like, I guess this is what my funeral is going to be like. Just in your face. Yeah. So they end up collecting Yvette because, of course, she's been listening in the billiards room. And uh, this is where Wadsworth gives them the kind of rundown of who he really is. So he says he was Body's butler, that this guy hated them all because they were unpatriotic. Wait, sorry. Okay. No, no, no. So this is the thing. So they're like, he decided to put his information to good use and make a little money out of it. What could be more American than that? Cut to Peacock, who just silently nods like, yep. (laughs) (laughs) And then, yes, we had friends who were socialists, and then just cut to everyone, and then Peacock in the middle is like, (gasps) (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so this is where I'm actually going to step away from the comedy and do a brief, like, a two-minute history lesson for folks who don't know, so... I cued everyone earlier that the time period that this film is set in is important. So this was the time period when the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, was kind of at the height of its power. So this was an investigative committee that was created in 1938, so post-World War II. It kind of got started going into it and then continued afterwards. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, and... Basically, their purpose was to uncover citizens that were suspected of having ties to communists. So this is also known as the Red Scare period because we were so afraid of Russians. And this is when Senator Joseph McCarthy had begun this campaign against communists in specifically the U.S. government and other institutions. And it was very much a witch hunt, like, tattle on your neighbors, we'll put them on this blacklist, we'll get them fired, they won't be able to work again. It was actually a very big issue in Hollywood because they basically just used it as an excuse to get rid of pretty much anybody who was Jewish. Well, I was going to say, though, because we we talked back when we talked about Dracula's daughter, you know, we talked about Hedda Hopper. Wasn't Hedda Hopper like oh, really yeah. into this? Oh, yeah. She yeah. basically used this to kick Charlie Chaplin out of the country. Jesus. Yeah. <sighs> and the height of this period was 1950 to 1954. Or Mm-hmm. And also relevant to our queer angle on this particular film, there was a sort of secondary witch hunt that was occurring that was called the Lavender Scare. So this is also mm-hmm. when they were trying to expose gays and lesbians who were working in the government and other institutions with access to sensitive information. And they basically thought that the queer community was more susceptible to manipulation. So they were trying to out people so that they could get them blacklisted and basically just ruin their livelihood because they thought the queers weren't trustworthy which explains so why at least with the first two endings green is paying his blackmail yes. yes i don't know about y'all but every time he says like he says like you know i'm blah blah, blah and i'm a homosexual i always look at the other people to be like oh how do they react and i think really only peacock is the one who kind of gives this kind of like ugh face. yes Right, and yep. she doesn't like anyone. So. No, no, really. <laughs> she, she is passing moral judgment on every single person in this room. Right. Yeah. Uh. Except I think maybe Colonel Mustard when he reveals that he's a war profiteer, because she's kind of like, well, oh. that's sort of who I am as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except when he talks about, like, she does, like, kind of grill him when uh, she says, like, a lot of our airmen died because oh, those radios yes. didn't work. But yeah. that's oh, not yeah. till after all that, yeah. But even because Joe, speaking of like, I mean, like just you know, turning your neighbors in. I mean, you know, I live in Texas, and that oh, is, God. I mean, it's, it's kind of up in the air. But it's a thing where it's like, oh, you can get ten thousand dollars for turning someone in who's going to get an abortion. Yep, oh, that's so fucking scary. Fucking nuts. It's hor- it, it, it was a whole thing where they were like, oh, like should Uber drivers who are driving people to get abortions be held responsible if they know what they're doing? Then they mm-hmm. should be fined for driving someone to get an abortion. 
Yeah. My God. So yeah. Disgusting. And the difference is basically just that at this time period that we're talking about in the film, it was actually government sanctioned, whereas here the government are fucking wimpy ass yep. losers. So they're delegating the task to average citizens to be like, cool, now you can become Dog the Bounty Hunter for mm-hmm. women who want abortions. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, yeah. it, it, it's just so funny because like when, when I, I mean, I, I know it's still like up in the air because I think, I think some Senate like blocked the bans like the, God, the abortion so. thing can't be enforced yet yet Oof. is that a double negative i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but even talking about it, oh it's just like this mccarthyism shit yeah yeah turning americans against each other i mean like mm-hmm. I'm saying like this fucking patriotism whatever but well which listen that's what <laughs> that's what the other countries want though yeah like, that is what like russia and china like that's what they want they want us to turn against each other and so like the fact that we're kind of doing it to ourselves like the self-sabotage that's happening is so depressing and it's just always been this way i mean then the united states is an ironic name to have absolutely yeah it's so <laughs> when true have oh you God. folks been united just out of curiosity <laughs> yeah for real it's sort of ironic though that like this stuff happened so quickly after world war ii mm-hmm. and after we saw like how neighbors would turn in like their Jewish neighbors to the Nazis yeah. and they would just like turn people yeah. over or like how kids who were in Hitler youth would like turn their parents in yeah. for helping Jewish families and stuff like that. It's so. Yeah. And the only difference is just, just that, just Oh, this is Americans and we're protecting Americans from communists. Yeah. 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 See also, cause I, uh, it'll be out by this point, but our Patreon episode of midnight mass, where we talked about the, the consequences of blind faith and mm-hmm. using the scripture to twist words and do evil. That yeah. show yes. was so fucking good. Oh, it's so fantastic. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So back to this movie and back to the wacky hijinks. I apologize for like no. deflating the balloon there for a <laughs> no, moment. No, I'm glad you did. Because, I mean, <laughs> no, again, somebody's like... got to stay on track. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> again, th- this is one more. It's okay. We went through the production, but honestly, we're going to, like, we're having fun. We're talking about our favorite lions. And so mm-hmm. I-, I appreciate the at least a little bit of like historical context and analysis that we can do <laughs> to, to yes, offer something. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Because it, it's always been one of those things where I didn't really understand why is this movie set in the middle of the 50s? Like, I yeah. just thought that it was kind of an Agatha Christie, old fashioned murder mystery thing. And then you realize, mm-hmm. oh, actually, the whole thing is really tied up in McCarthyism and the post-war fervor. Because mm-hmm. these are bad people. They've all done bad things. But arguably, you could say that Colonel Mustard and Miss Peacock and to a lesser extent, the blackmailer himself are all the real villains because they're the ones who are doing systematic damage. Like yes, Scarlet is just is, yes. letting people Great get their point. rocks off. Well, but she's also selling secrets. <laughs> okay, sure. Right, that's in that. <laughs> yeah, that's oh my God, that's only, in, that's only in ending A, Trace. Come on. True, right. True. <laughs> I, I, I know we're not there. But I know the way she says secrets, like, she, it's like, I don't know. It's secrets. like, it's like her, but it's like her mouth is half full of saliva. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. I'm so glad that you know. <laughs> <laughs> I sell secrets. <laughs> secrets. <laughs> You're like, what the fuck? She's like, we really had to go with that take. Thanks everyone. She's like, <laughs> I, I, know. I, I haven't been able to sit down for the entire month long of shooting. I just want to <laughs> say my line and get out. <laughs> my mouth has just been collecting saliva the entire time because I can't sit up. Right. <laughs> These fucking corsets. <laughs> also, I can improv just as well as the other ladies. Secrets. <laughs> <laughs> no, because when she pulls the warm. gun out, she's like, it's like she's thrusting her stomach forward almost because the yes. corset is like bending yeah. her body backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Get me out of this costume. <laughs> <sighs> she looks like a piece of asparagus. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? It's just ramrod straight, right? <laughs> no, because of the way that she's like shaped and the dress oh, and like the color oh. of the dress too. <laughs> Abigail. <laughs> I'm not body shaming i'm just saying that's what pops into my head when i see her describe yourself as a fruit or vegetable that's all we're saying (laughs) yes so speaking of food we should probably check in with the cook oh shit she's dead she's in the freezer with a knife in her back oh no best line who would want to kill the cook dinner wasn't that bad So Great mean. Line. Also, if you watch, because like whenever the cook falls on green, he's like, "Somebody help me!" And 
we cut back to them and Scarlet rushes forward. But then it cuts back <laughs> and she just like <laughs> runs around the body and Green stands there and smokes her cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'll pretend to come over and help you, but really I'm just going to stand here and smoke and maybe pass some judgment. <laughs> yes. She gets a better look of the dilemma from that angle. <laughs> yes. So we return to the study and we discover, oh, Mr. Body's body has disappeared. And this is when Peacock says that she's going to go to the bathroom. And I love a French joke as well. So uh, she says, <laughs> is there a bathroom in the hall? And Yvette goes, oui, oui, madame. And then Peacock goes, no, I just want to powder my nose. <laughs> Yes. So what what do y'all think though of the bit where because you know we get um Scarlet pulls out the negatives of the pictures and we know that it's Colonel Mustard fucking well mm-hmm. not at this point someone but it's gonna it's revealed to be a vet but again this is the most salacious part of the movie for me when when one positions like, white yeah she goes get nobody no nobody can get to that position and Christopher Lloyd's like sure they can let me show you and he like pulls her down on the mm-hmm. couch and gets her in a sex position. Get off yeah. me. Yeah, but like <laughs> she has a beat where she's kind of like, oh, I guess you can get into this position. Sh- and then she goes, get <laughs> off me. Yeah. Yeah, she lets it happen. And then she's like, wait, no, stop. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I was also curious. And now I have my confirmation. You may depart. <laughs> but also the position yeah. i mean maybe it's because it's a pg-rated movie but like the position didn't look that complicated it looks like it was just like oh one leg is up in the air trace is like a, that's a friday afternoon <laughs> this was the 50s, the 50s. though so. right. <laughs> proper morals yeah. oh no uh. Okay, so they move these corpses onto the couch, and they decide, okay, we're going to lock up the weapons, so they put them into a cabinet, and Wadsworth is going to throw away the key, and they open the door, and there's a motorist standing on the doorstep, and he is played by Jeffrey Kramer. There's a whole thing later where it's, oh, like, he didn't really throw the key, he put it in his pocket. Isn't there a shot of the key hitting, like, the opposite side of the driveway and going into the bushes? Yes. Yes, I think it's that he swapped the keys. Or it was a spare or something, right? Okay, movie. (laughs) It's it's a little bit dodgy. Completely missed all of this. There's oh. absolutely a shot of it bouncing into the grass, and then mm-hmm. later on he's like, yeah, somebody must have picked uh, the key out of oh my pocket, and you're like, yeah, okay, sure, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. Th- th- that's always the one where I'm like, this, like, it's like misery when she's doing that that spiel about like, he didn't get out of the cock a car! They cheated! He didn't throw the cock a key! Right. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> And for that, we have to kill six different informants. <laughs> oh my god. So they take this motorist and they lock him in the lounge, which I, I love the repeated gag where people show up unexpectedly and they're trying to cover up the fact that there are just dead bodies accumulating around this mansion. So they just keep <laughs> locking them into rooms. Like, can you imagine yes. being one of these people and saying, I just need to use the phone. This group of shady ass motherfuckers is like, yeah. Yeah, just go into this room. <laughs> Click. Oh my god. I do also love the line, is everything okay? And Colonel Mustard goes, yep, two bodies, all accounted for. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So this is the part where they decide that they're going to pair up and explore the rest of the house because we don't trust that Wadsworth is telling the truth that there's no one else here. So again, when they're doing this and like, and like oh yeah, like, we'll, we'll figure out who the murderer is. And Peacock's like, but the other half of the pair would be dead. And then Mustard's like, this is war, <laughs> Peacock. You, 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 can't, uh, you can't make an omelet without cracking a few eggs. Any cook will tell you that. But look what, what happened, happened to the, to the cook! <laughs> Just like, the way it that didn't he have says to be it, this too. clever. This is war, Peacock! <laughs> You're like, sir, no it is not. This is a dinner party that has gone horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, honestly. Oh, geez. <laughs> Truly. I will say, I'm not bothered by all of the kind of gay jokes that they do with Mr. Green, but yeah. if I have a favorite, it's probably the one oh. where Yvette says... You know, I need someone to go with me because I am so scared. <laughs> and all of the men fall over themselves to say yes. And Green's just like, no. Nah. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> I was going to ask you all what you thought of the of the gay jokes in this. Honestly, the only one that I really remember every time I watch it is whenever Scarlet goes, oh, really? I think men like you were called a fruit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but, oh, no. 
I find it's just that like was... it's it's a reference, but it's not a joke. So it's just kind of there for me. It doesn't bother me, but I'm also yeah. like, it doesn't add anything. Mm-hmm. But it also doesn't turn yeah. me on Scarlet yeah. because it's not Scarlet going, "Oh, you're a fruit." I mean, I think she is making a joke, but like, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think it's mean spirited, and also because mm-hmm. obviously Scarlet's very sexually progressive. I'm just like, oh, I'm sure she loves the gays, right? She oh, probably has gay sure. informants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely it's truly seriously she seems like a woman who would have boy hustlers in her red themed establishment yeah which i don't know i feel like i feel like she's also sort of queer coded because she takes mm-hmm. a gander at yvette's breasts and is like what are you hiding in there or what are you keeping warm or something she says I don't oh know. yeah and yeah. i was like i was like oh well it's because yvette is her well, well. employee right yeah. so right I definitely paid more attention to the way that they interact this time. And it's very much like, uh, hey, good to see you here. Ha ha, Mm -hmm. wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But you're absolutely right that there's a certain appreciative glancing at Yvette, Mm -hmm. also from Scarlet. Mm -hmm. She sometimes, though, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but she seems kind of like predatory Mm -hmm. sometimes. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like there were some parts upon rewatching this movie where I was like, ooh, like, just because she's a woman, she doesn't get a pass kind of thing. Oh, for like, sure. I'm glad you noticed that, Interesting. Abby. Yeah, like, I don't know. See, that's so funny, because I feel like that's something Trace and I would have just unabashedly praised. Like, oh, she's sexually liberated, and she gets <laughs> yeah. to sexually harass anyone she wants. Yeah, no. <laughs> Oh, does it not work that way? <laughs> Shit. I mean, I also think it's interesting. I mean, it's not really a huge deal, but it's like, again, we have three endings. Two of them, it's female, like the, the women did it. Yeah. And then the yes. other one, it's like, oh, every, there's never um, an ending where it's, oh, just one of the men. So I'm surprised, you know, I mean, even though the peacock ending is kind of the weakest one, I'm surprised they didn't be like, oh, let's make one of the men the killer for this one. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Yeah, that is true. That's actually pretty progressive because... Especially, like, for that time period, there aren't a lot of female villains that are, like, hmm. really, truly bad. They usually have, like, some kind of angle or, like, or some sort of kind redeeming. of, like, funny. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. Also, they use weapons that are considered very masculine, I feel like, right. too. Like, it's a lot of phallic yeah. objects yes. in this movie. <laughs> right. Like, women normally... Poison, I think, is what the common thing is. And mm-hmm. none of the, there's no poison in this. No. I mean, they think there is, but there isn't. I wonder if that's just because they had to play within the confines of the game, but it's also like, cool, okay, we can't do, like, I would argue the knife is probably the most traditionally female weapon Mm. after poison, and yet Mm -hmm. even that, it only gets one murder out of it. Well, I think think each weapon gets one more. Does any any weapon get more than one besides the revolver? Uh, Oh. No, you might be right, actually. Yeah. Does the lead pipe? No, because I, I thought the motors was killed with the lead pipe, but the motors was killed with the wrench, and the cop is killed with the lead pipe. Yeah, I think it's right. one and or then the other. And then there's the candlestick, yep. which is a similar That's Mr. Body. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Rewinding a tiny bit, I don't know if really this means anything at all, so we can just skip it a bit if y'all want to discuss it, but like, this is 85, you know, it's set in the 50s, it's gay jokes, blah, blah, blah. When this is being filmed, it is like we are entering the height of the AIDS crisis. Oh, yeah. yes. yes. I was thinking that. Absolutely. So. Yeah, definitely. No, that's for sure, like, very culturally relevant, I feel like. Also, mm-hmm. we're, because I was born in 88, so I'm uh, a little off with this, I think, but was the Cold War? Cold War was still pretty. It's just starting to wrap up. Yeah. It's just starting to wrap mm-hmm. up. Okay. Sorry, it's starting to wrap up when you're born, but it would have still been pretty high in the mid 80s. Yeah. So even this whole, like, this whole thing about like distrust yes. and, and putting McCarthyism in general would right. still be very yeah, yeah 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 right yeah oh because everything happens in thirty year cycles apparently <laughs> yeah oh my god <laughs> <laughs> you're right <laughs> well shit <laughs> <laughs> see y'all in a uh, twenty forty something yep <laughs> no 20, 20, 50, oh, 20, 50, 20, 50 something <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yes, everybody pairs up. So we've got Yvette with Green in the attic. We've got Scarlet and Mustard on the ground floor, Wadsworth and White on the second floor, and Plum and Peacock in the cellar. And I do love this section has arguably some of the best physical comedy bits mm-hmm. as nobody trusts each other so they don't want to go before or behind anybody. So it's a lot of people <laughs> squishing their bodies through tight places. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> but also, what are you afraid of? A fate worse than death? No, just death. Isn't that enough? <laughs> just for sh- but truly. <laughs> That's just smart. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. <laughs> 
So one of my new favorite affectations is when Miss White is just by herself and she goes, are you hiding? I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a weird line. Like if people haven't paid attention to it, I would honestly encourage you to seek it out because it's just like, lady, what are you doing? It's so amazing. And meanwhile, you know, like Wadsworth is just like turning on the shower on himself. I know exactly what, what part you're talking about. But also, this is when we're, we lose track of people. Like even yes. though mm-hmm. we, ha- we have them paired off, we have a lot of shots where it is just one person because they're split up in the room they're in. Mm-hmm. So it makes it easy for the audience to be like, oh, shit, like, I don't know where anyone is in this movie. But at the same time, you're just kind of like, oh, partners, like, why are you looking at your partners? <laughs> right. And also, yes. like, all the murders happen on the ground floor. So mm-hmm. your best bet is probably one of the two people who were on the ground floor. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Which is maybe why Scarlet does make sense as a killer, because she has a lot of access. Yeah. That's what I've heard is that a lot of people, I guess, really love the Scarlet ending because yeah. it makes the most sense to them. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can definitely see it. Like, her motivation makes perfect sense. She does have a very close relationship with Yvette. And, Mm -hmm. yeah, and she's got access to kill both the motorist, the police officer, and And she's unapologetic from the get-go. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 She might be kind of a sociopath. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) uh, Actually, question for y'all. When y'all play Clue, who do you play as? I always play as, I'm not even kidding, I always play as Miss Scarlet because she goes oh. first. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. She yep. goes first in the game and you can't, I don't know, I just feel like you're better off going first in anything. <laughs> <laughs> Except if you're playing the squid game. No, what God. Was that? The- oh, God. <laughs> no, oh, no. No spoilers, but there's yeah. one game where going first is maybe not such a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> oh, no. To be really honest with you, Mm -hmm. I hate board games, (gasps) and I've never played Clue. Mm -hmm. But it's also kind of a card game. (laughs) (laughs) That's true, that's true. And I'm still saying no. (laughs) My Yeah, I know. My cousins always were like, come in, like at every holiday gathering, come in, let's play Clue, come in, you never want to play. And I'm like... Fuck, I just hate board games. (laughs) Just watch the movie. (laughs) Yeah, I'll watch the movie while you play the game. (laughs) <laughs> yes, precisely, precisely. Uh, okay, so Trace, who did you play? It's either Scarlet or Green, because Green's my favorite color, but I also play as Scarlet because, A, she was sexy, and yes, she goes first. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Uh, I think the one or two times that I've actually tried to play this, I played as Plum, because I thought, oh, well, if I'm a professor, then maybe that will help to imbue me with some intelligence. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's, no, you know what? I like that line of thinking. <laughs> it doesn't pay off no. clearly because I, oh, I actually because in the game too mrs white's the maid so i remember when i first saw this movie i would always get oh. so mad that mrs white wasn't yvette right mm-hmm. oh yeah yeah when you're a little kid like that logic is like yeah, yeah. is unforgivable <laughs> like yeah. doesn't strictly adhere it's like yes. so i saw the ghostbusters movie for the first time after i had seen i think it was called the extreme ghostbusters cartoon and in that cartoon there was a female ghostbuster and so oh. when i first saw the movie ghostbusters i was so mad because i wow. thought i thought sigourney weaver was going to become one of the ghostbusters oh, <laughs> see that would have been great oh, yeah i know yeah. shut up <laughs> leave it to the 90s cartoon of Go- extreme ghostbusters to put a woman in the mix there we yes. go yes mm-hmm. see Okay, so I said I don't actually play the game Clue very often, but I did have this weird knockoff game. I'm curious to hear from any listeners who may have heard it. It was called 13 13 Dead End Drive. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I played it. (laughs) I've never even heard of it. Me neither. It's kind of fun because it's the same principle, but you're moving. It is a board game, so I'm sorry, Abby. You basically just move the character (laughs) around, but the idea is like, whoever's pitcher is on the mantle will inherit this dead woman's fortune so you're trying to knock off other players so like you can move your player but you can also move other players and then you move them into traps where they will be killed yes but my favorite thing about this is that you can play as the dead woman's cat so the cat can be one of the characters that inherits (laughs) the fortune so i always played as the cat well, so the way it worked was, I think there's like 12 characters, yeah. depending on how many players you had. So if you only had three players, then each player would be four characters. Yes. Wow. And basically, like, there were character cards in the portrait, like Joe said, but you would rotate them, like, based mm-hmm. on, like, I guess you laid on a space. But yeah, there was, you could either drop a chandelier on someone, you could mm-hmm. knock them down the stairs, you could throw them into the fireplace, you could yep. drop a knight statue on them, or you could drop, uh, oh, they could climb to the top of the bookcase and the ladder will fall and they'll yes. break your neck. 
It was so fun. Ooh, so fun. It was kind of like a mouse trap thing where you were just yeah. actively looking to set off traps and kill people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, wow. we'll send y'all. We'll send y'all a picture of because this game took like thirty minutes to set up because you had to set all the traps up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But it's a kids' game. It's not like a strategy board no. game where it's like, oh, I'm reading instructions for three hours. Like it's it's just it's a basic game that just takes thirty minutes to set up. There were parts. There were parts to set up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I'm oh so glad God. you played that. I used to play it with my sister all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's a sillier version, I think, of Clue. Mm-hmm. Mm. Give me that movie. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, everybody is exploring, and as this happens, we have a police officer who is played by Bill Henderson, who is checking out broken cars, and then this is where somebody burns the evidence, opens the cabinet, collects the weapons, murders the motorist in the lounge, and then that's when Mustard and Scarlet discover the body, and we get the fantastic scene where they're trying to get out, and everyone else is trying to get in, but also everyone collides on the stairs, and yeah, this is funny. So good. Apparently that too, um, that, um, apparently, like, those are stunt doubles when they all collapse on the stairs, and it's really, if you pause it and, like, look at it, it's really obvious it's stunt doubles. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, <laughs> I never noticed, but... <laughs> Me neither! <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm gonna go back and watch it. There we That's go. not you. <laughs> in case anybody is wondering what it's like to live in a house with multiple children, mm-hmm. that's what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Just people constantly running at each other full speed. Oh, oh, it's yeah. so true. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as you have health care, that's all that's matters. Yeah, yeah exactly. I suppose. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so this is where we get the fun gag as Yvette tries to shoot out the door, but she accidentally shoots at the chandelier and she nearly kills Mustard. And this is where we realize, oh shit, how did she even get the gun? The cabinet has been open this whole time. Uh, mm-hmm. And then this is when the police officer arrives and they have to kind of play it cool. So they home alone style all of the <laughs> corpses in the rooms to make it seem like it's just a happening party. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is a life could be a dream, sweetheart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Scooby Dooby Doo. Oh my! <laughs> I do enjoy that Ms. White is just actively making out with the body. She truly of is, Mr. Body. <laughs> she is a freaky, freaky lady. <laughs> She's like, oh, you remind me of one of my five husbands. <laughs> That's, surprise, that's my kink. (laughs) Well, they never said she did anything with the body, so we don't know. I mean, she could. It's true. It's true. (laughs) So there's a funny line where the police officer is obviously not observing anything illegal. So he says, well, there's nothing illegal here. And Wadsworth goes, there isn't. And he goes, this is America. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes this is the land of the free don't you know it's i didn't know it was that free <laughs> something like that <laughs> yes. so they lock him back up and go back to searching the house and uh this is when yvette meets her untimely end i do love the last minute reveal that yvette is not actually french <laughs> Yes. Oh, I, I remember every time she died, I always thought like, it was a mistake. So, oh. I, uh, Listen, can we talk about what she says, though? Do you understand what she's trying to say in that scene? Because she says, like, they know it's me and they know every inch of my body. And I remember I watched it this time around and I was like, what the fuck does that even mean? Like, what is she talking well, about? Do you know? If she's talking about Scarlet, mm-hmm. then that makes sense. Well, and Mustard already fucked her. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it her in the picture? Maybe. Yeah, it is her in the picture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. 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 So I will say that as a child, this murder scene actually scared the crap out of me. Not because of the fact that she died, but because the voice of the killer Mm -hmm. is very. It's like scary. This, okay, so this is a straight up giallo right yes, here. Yes, yes, I the yes. black one. Oh my god, for real. <laughs> Thank you. It's so, yes. The only thing I don't like about it is I wanted her to walk into a noose and have it be that she gets hung from the sorry, hanged from the ceiling because this one is like a lazy lasso around her neck and then she pulls herself into it and yeah. dies. Yep. <laughs> which, yeah. which if she was a dumb character, that would make more sense, but I don't think she's a dumb character character she's playing dumb no right. no she's no, no. definitely playing dumb for sure yeah mm-hmm. yeah because this is the reveal that she's actually 
been putting on a fake act the Mm -hmm. entire movie, right? So we have to Mm -hmm. assume that she's like an undercover agent for Scarlet or that Mm -hmm. she's even going out on her own. I was frightened. I also drank the cognac. (laughs) (laughs) Mondo! (laughs) Mondo! It's like a French version of Boris and Natasha. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Okay, so Yvette is dead, the police officer is also murdered, and this is where the singing telegram girl also meets her end. She is played by Jane Mm. Wielden. Okay, so here's the thing. So I I think, Gracie, maybe you mentioned earlier how short this movie is. When Wadsworth says, I know who did it, I'm going to tell you how it's all done. Mm -hmm. It is an hour and eight minutes into this movie. Yep, yep. Like, whoa! Yeah. It's an hour-long game, and then we get the reveal. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah that's a that's a good point hmm. yeah uh i do also enjoy the line six murders this is getting serious <laughs> 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 and just the fact that none of them react anymore like they're just I walking know. around yeah new oh, bodies that is so good where they see all the bodies and they're like okay yep mm-hmm. earlier when they do the smash cut when they have the body it just smash cuts to them just dropping it in the study mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, I mm, you could definitely make the argument that I'm being too sensitive, but the way that they handle the cook's body feels very like uncomfortably fat shamey now that I'm oh, watching yes. it. Yes. Yep. No, you're not being sensitive. That's a very good point. It, it is a fact. Although I do love the line where they're just like, just lay her over the arm and bend her over. But yeah. I kinda like how Professor Plum doesn't know what to do with his arm, so he just kind of casually puts it on her lower back like it's an armrest i guess yeah. but you're right there's literally like a four second shot when they're picking her up to put her on the on the couch and it's just everyone is like looking like they are just lifting the heaviest thing imaginable mm-hmm. yeah. and there's four of them lifting her <laughs> right i know like uh... there's something scientific about a dead body weighing more but we don't get the same kind of exertion when we're moving mr body's body mm-hmm. right yeah, seriously. Yeah. Um, okay, so six murders. This is now very serious, but Wadsworth has figured it out, so he is going to run them through the evening. And he was in the hall. He knows because he was there. <laughs> I mean, we don't have to go through this entire, because obviously, like, it's just repeating his lines. But my favorite bit here is whenever he, he does the introduction, he goes, And Mrs. White, oh, pale and tragic. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part is when he is like, and I think they go into the library study. I don't remember, but he goes, and then I introduce them. Hello, hello. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my god, that's like peak Tim Curry. Uh, it, it's interesting. <laughs> Do you feel like this is the moment where Tim Curry really gets his moment because he's had a lot yes. of other funny parts, but he, in a way, is almost the narrator slash audience surrogate. Like he delivers the exposition, he gets the characters to where they need to be, but then this is the part where he gets to run around like he has drunk eight Red Bulls and he has energy to burn. Well, so cocaine. So for <laughs> the cocaine. cocaine. <laughs> so you know what's so funny? I'm gonna go actually go back to the musical because oh, okay. Mr. Body in the musical is sort of the narrator for the audience. Okay. He actually, like, even though he is dead, he kind of narrates what's happening and what's going on. He has a song and stuff, even though he's like I said, he's dead and whatever. <laughs> okay. And his like high energy level in the musical is basically what tim curry's energy is oh wow yes in this film which makes me think that that was kind of on purpose because the i'm pretty sure the musical came after this movie oh for sure and yeah i think that that's sort of what they were going for with the mr body character hmm. um in the musical was to be like tim curry and abby you said this was peak tim curry i almost I just don't know if I necessarily agree with this role as peak Tim Curry, but how he's acting at the end is for sure, like, that is the Tim Curry that, like, I've been, like, waiting for. Mm. Oh, yes, yes, that's what I meant. Like, as far as the film goes. Uh, Right, because we all know Rocky Horror and Muppet Treasure Island our peak yes. Tim Curry. Like, <laughs> oh my god. Her. I yep. made my mom take me to go see Muppet Treasure Island and she fell asleep and never, for my birthday by the way, really? and oh. she never let me hear the end of it and how terrible it was. Are you <laughs> oh kidding? Oh my god. Yeah, no. 
You know, Trace, your mom has committed a lot of sins, but this, <laughs> this might be a top ranking one. I think it's why, like, because I mean, my parents never liked the Muppets when I was growing up. But I, I think no. that I think that movie experience and her being so like put out by having to go see this movie made me like hate the Muppets for the rest of my life. <gasps> oh, oh you my poor God. dear. Um, also, the no. Clue musical was 1997. Oh wow! There you go. Okay. On so Broadway. I, oh, okay. Yeah. On Broadway. I love Off Broadway. That. Off Broadway. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was going to say, I don't think it was it on Broadway. Oh, my God. It was in New York, just off Broadway. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. So he runs them through everything. We've got the iconic score going. We've got the joke, make a long story short, too late, and get on with too it late. repeatedly. <laughs> I don't think we need to run through how everybody is connected, but basically several of the murders were committed by Yvette. Uh, we also have a very quick introduction by an evangelist who is played in an uncredited role by Howard Hessman. And I do love Miss Peacock's dismissive, get out of here, you beatnik. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Was it whenever he answers, she opens the door. She's like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> Our lives are in danger, you beatnik! <laughs> go away! Whoever it is, they gotta go away, or they'll be killed." <laughs> yes, the best. <laughs> There's just so much yeah. arm motions in these scenes, too, right? I know. <laughs> Did we forget to mention how Mrs. Peacock's head thing, <gasps> her feathers just like fell in her oh, face what? at one point? Oh, yes. And she's oh, like God. trying to say her lines. Okay, is that improv or is that intended? Because it is comedic genius. Oh, it's so good. I hope and pray that it was improv, but I don't Me know. Too. <laughs> it was so perfect. Oh, my just, God. Like, puffing it out of the way in between yeah. lines. <laughs> she is such a hot mess i love it so we now have our three endings so in the a it was scarlet and yes she is looking for government secrets secrets i'm so glad y'all validated my saying that because i have every time i watch this movie i'm like she just says secrets so weird <laughs> yes Oh my god. I will say we sounded like we didn't like Leslie Ann Warren quite as much as the other women, but I think this is the moment where she also gets to do the best word gag with yes. Wadsworth yes. when she does the no, one and two and when they're counting the bullets, shut it's up. all very fun. <laughs> yeah, the shut up is so funny. <laughs> shut up. Yes. I mean cuz I mean she's the femme fatale. Mhm. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, it's it, this. This is definitely her showcase moment, which honestly may be why. I mean, when when writing the script, he was like, "Oh, I haven't really given Scarlet a moment, so maybe that's why one of the endings is this." Maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the B ending is with Peacock, and this is that she works for multiple foreign powers. We have Wadsworth is actually secretly working for J. Edgar Hoover, and uh, we do get that funny moment where Mister Green says. She was a man, and then he just gets slapped twice. They're like, you dumbass. <laughs> so apparently that's also a bit of wordplay, because a peacock is actually a male version of a peacock. A, yes! A female peacock is called a peahen. Yes, okay. that's true. Oh, wow. Wow. That is a deep cut wordplay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what no, I'm saying, though. So I mean, like, layers. This, this script is rich. With just jokes of dumb and intelligent variety. Mm -hmm. And I have seen this movie at least, at least 25 times in my life. Wow. Every time I watch it, I catch something new. Every single time. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for pointing that out. I didn't even catch that. <laughs> Was Stanley Kubrick involved in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> Was there a chair in one scene and then they cut back and the chair is gone? <laughs> I think you're thinking of Mr. Body's Body. No! Oh, oh. No. <laughs> so the C ending is by far the longest one, and this is where more or less everybody has a part to play. And I think that's part of the reason why it feels so satisfying, because it it doesn't suggest that one person could have committed all of this, and it also paints all of these horrible people as equally guilty. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, Plum killing Mr. Body, Peacock killing the cook, Colonel Mustard killing the motorist, White killing Yvette for the flames on the sides of my face. <laughs> Sorry, we all had to do it at some point, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> We have Scarlet killing the cop Wadsworth, shooting the singing telegram girl, and the revelation that he is actually Mr. Body, and Mr. Mm -hmm. Body was his butler, and then Green is revealed to be the one who is working for the FBI. 
and he is also straight and he's going to go home. And if this movie was made now, he would say, I'm going to go home and fuck my wife. So, okay, I, I do agree plot wise, this is the best ending. My, my two gripes, I actually don't like that all of them get arrested at the end. Like, I, I know, like, they're all bad and they all, they all they did crimes. And I'm like, oh, I don't like that they're, they're all murderers. But again, like, I do like the whole, oh, I, I shot Mr. Body in the hall with the revolver. Mm -hmm. And I, I do really hate that we walk back Green's queerness. Like, yes. honestly, I've never put that much thought into it, really, until this viewing when I was like, oh, wait, that only applies to this ending. It yes. doesn't apply to any of the other endings. No. So yeah. for that reason alone, that's why I think I think I prefer the Scarlet ending because, yes, it makes the most sense. And we still have a queer character. The last one doesn't do that. So I, you know, what's so funny is that I always kind of felt like he was still playing like yes. pretend. I've seen mm -hmm. theories uh, about that on Reddit. Yeah, because oh. it's so funny that you say that because I never once thought he was not a queer character and mm -hmm. that his whole like and i'm gonna go home and sleep with my wife just yeah. seems like such a cover because he's like trying to like say like yep i'm gonna go do that you see like he's you know what i mean okay it's very performative okay. yeah like, and so i'm not gay I can yeah back that up <laughs> because he says that after his colleagues from the fbi have come in so if right. we use the principles of the lavender scare he may have not been ashamed yes. of it when he says it to this group of people, but around the people who could arrest him or cause him to lose his job, he has to yep. go back into the closet and be like, I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife. Yeah, because that seems <laughs> very, wink, wink. <laughs> that seems very like 1950s, like the way that he said it too. Like, I just feel yeah. like, it, yeah, like Abby, you said, it's very performative. And I, I just always thought that he was still acting so you know in front of those guys. So, yeah, I'm going to go with that. But I guess because my mindset is like, you know, again, his story is that he was being blackmailed for being gay. Mm -hmm. But in this ending, is that also a story that he was being blackmailed? Like, was he planted there right. by the FBI? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I guess that's just up for interpretation. I guess however you want to see the film. It's true. You know, what? you're right. He's gay. <laughs> <laughs> No straight man, no straight man would ever say something like that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but I mean, he's so he's so dumb and nervous and... Yeah. <laughs> Lots of straight white men who might say that, mm. yes. <laughs> yeah, I actually found a Reddit thread that went on this whole speculative fiction. It's almost like fan fiction or slash fiction in a way where they say... Oh, so what was actually happening was Mr. Green is actually gay, and he was sleeping with Mr. Body or the butler, depending on which <gasps> version that you're doing this with, because he's an informant, right? Like, that's how Wadsworth or Mr. Body, whoever is blackmailing, discovered that he was actually queer, right? Like, you needed to have some proof. Yes! So then it's oh, like, wow. because he works for the FBI, he was able to organize this, like, sting where he would be a plant so that he could get to the evidence and cover it up so that he doesn't get outed to his work colleagues. And I was like, holy shit, somebody spent a lot of time thinking about this. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I appreciate it, Bob. <laughs> I know, seriously. I have always wanted to rewatch the movie. Again, watch ending A, go back and watch the movie up until ending A starts and see if I can make sense. Watch ending B, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And uh, ending C is the hardest for that, though, because everyone is involved. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. But also yeah, at the end yeah. of the day, I mean, I recognize that critics didn't like the fact that they had to chase around the endings and that kind of stuff. But I kind of feel like this movie doesn't hinge on whoever the murderer is. Like, that presupposes that you're watching this as an actual mystery. I'm watching this as a comedy. So if the ending right. doesn't 100% work or if one ending is better than another... I still got 89 minutes of fucking hilarious comedy. And that's what's most important for me. Like, I don't really care mm. who the killer is. Yeah. No, I, I, agree. Yes. I agree. Yeah. I think if you go into it with that mindset, then yes, you're, you're bound to have a good time with it. But right. If you're a critic and you're like, what the fuck kind of murder mystery? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so all that to say, fuck you, Janet Maslin, and fuck you, Siskel and Ebert. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> no lies detected. Uh, no. And no. I mean that's clue, and that's we're gonna clue. shake, rattle, and rock. Wait, roll, roll, <laughs> is it roll, roll, rock, roll. Or roll. I don't know. What? A... <laughs> I don't know. Either way, it's a good time. I used to, I used to dance to these credits. You know, just oh, dance sure. around the room. 
Oh, when I was watching it earlier, my little boy was with me in the kitchen and I was dancing with him to the song when it was playing. <laughs> but it was fun. Whenever we watch movies for this, you know, I'm like, okay, I got, I got my thinking brain on. I'm ready to do analysis, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And last night when I was watching this, I was just like, fuck it. I can't, I, I can't just, I can't stop laughing. No, it's too funny. <laughs> Oh my god, same. Same. I was like, okay, serious business. I got like my little <laughs> got notes my notepad out. out. <laughs> oh, I'm just writing down funny lines of dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Literally. And so honestly, I'm kind of glad we aren't called the comedy queers because I don't know what we would do. <laughs> <laughs> we would have to get really good at telling jokes or breaking them down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me tell you why this punctuation gag works as well as it does. Everybody take uh. a seat. <laughs> God, could you? That would just ruin. No, absolutely comedies. not. <laughs> I was gonna say everyone off. loves when a joke is explained. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and after that, we're gonna tell you how magic works. <laughs> uh, oh God. Man, well, okay. Final thoughts on Clue and ladies, please ask the guests of honor. Go first. Oh my gosh. Abby, Gracie, you go first. (laughs) (laughs) You little snot. Um, So I, yeah, I, like I said at the beginning, like this film, when I first saw it, the first time I remember seeing it, I felt like the jokes didn't land and I wasn't really getting it. But you know, I really think that this is sort of one of those films, at least for me, that you need to kind of watch it with others Uh because it is so quotable, because it is so memeable or whatever, like they're in, in the millennial humor whatever i think that it is something that uh can be enjoyed as a, like with a group mm-hmm. yeah like it's just one of those films that i had changed my mind on which you're allowed to do Absolutely. you know <laughs> so i'm really grateful that um i ended up marrying someone whose mother like really loved tim curry and like and i was able to like get reintroduced to this fi- reintroduced to this film and like watching it again and then of course doing it for this show it's just one of those uh movies that really grew on me and i'm really thankful for that because it is very funny. <laughs> yes. This movie is like a bowl of delicious mashed potatoes. <laughs> it's so like comfort food almost. Mm. Oh, like, yeah. If you're in like a not so great mood or like, I just remember after seeing this for the first time, like I would stay home from school sick. And like, this is one of those movies that I would put on like to make me feel better. Right. There is so much nostalgia attached to it for me that like it will always have a very special place in my Mm. heart but also the humor in it was kind of like a turning point for me it was kind of like a graduation from that like adolescent humor Mm. that i was so used to to like a more mature like you have to pay attention kind of thing so it it this movie kind of trained me to look for that humor in other movies. That's so true. It is a great gateway, just like Airplane, yes. too. Like you mentioned, <laughs> yes. Trace uh, yeah. and yeah. Joe. It's a great gateway film for comedy for young people. Mm-hmm. It is. I, I like what you're saying, too, because I think this film is a perfect blend of like immature slapstick humor, yes. but also <laughs> inte- that intelligent wordplay. So it works for adults, but it all, it's a rare comedy that works for adults and for kids. I mean... Again, you try to show this to a kid, you say, oh, it's a bunch of stuffy old people in a mansion. But there's (laughs) enough slapstick here to entertain them on a cartoon level. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. It's kind of like, it's kind of funny. It's kind of a reversal of like how kids cartoons will have like some adult yes. jokes yeah. thrown yes. in there. Yes. Oh my God. But it's like, it's something that you can watch with two different age groups and be really entertained. Mm-hmm. And it's also like, sort of an introduction to creepy movies or like murder mysteries Mm -hmm. like it doesn't take it too seriously but it's enough to kind of hook you absolutely yeah so i think that it's important in that way too like for a lot of people you might not get exposed to that kind of genre but you see a movie like clue and you're like oh well maybe i should i'll watch these other films right I could see this playing yeah. really well with something like Scooby Doo as gateway oh. horror, where you're like, "Oh, it's mm-hmm. spooky yes. mansion, it's people getting knocked off, crimes being committed, larger than life characters." But also, there's enough slapstick and you know embedded humor in there to make it go down just a little bit easier. I mean, th- yes. the the ending with the running back and forth. That mm-hmm. I, I didn't even think about Scooby Doo, so thank you. But you're right; like that feels very much like Scooby Doo. Mm-hmm. We're have the Scooby mm-hmm. Gang running around the mansion, like yep. running away from the killer, solving the mystery, like <laughs> getting 100. nowhere but running in place. 
Exactly. Yep. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, on a treadmill, running again. Yeah. Oh my. Exactly. Oh my god. That's fucking. That's what he was referring to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Now it's forgiven. Okay. We'll give you that one, you critic. <laughs> uh, but but he was using it as a negative, whereas we're all using it as a positive. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I love Clue. I think it's a fantastic film. I do think it's up there with Airplane as one of the best comedies ever made. I Absolutely. just... It, 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 even last night where I was like, oh, do I need to watch this again? I've seen this. I can play this movie in my head back to front. But no, I mean, every single time I watch this movie, I laugh my ass off. Even mm-hmm. at jokes, I, I could recite verbatim. Yeah. Yes. It's just so good. Yeah. I concur with everything everyone has said. I think for me, it's a great illustration of the kind of British sensibility that I'm really attracted to in Mm -hmm. comedy. Mm -hmm. That kind of high wit wordplay, but mixed with the kind of slapstick that I often see in American comedy. So Mm -hmm. I'm loving the fact because I didn't really know that it was derived by a British creator. So that makes so much more sense to me now, because it does feel like a really good seamless blend. And I don't know, I mean, I enjoyed doing some of the research for this to think about how the McCarthyism angle plays into it. But yeah, the Mm -hmm. film is just so fucking goddamn delightful. It's like Mm -hmm. 90 minutes of sheer bliss laughing my ass (laughs) off on the couch. And if you don't think so, then you can fuck off. (laughs) (laughs) You can go with Janet Maslin and Ebert. (laughs) I'm just kidding. You know what? You can have your own party. How about that? Yeah, please keep listening to us. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Wait, no, no, no. Stay here. (laughs) We love you. Don't leave us. Sorry. Unsubscribed. (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, (laughs) okay, so we're going to close this out. But before we announce what we're covering next week, I'm Gracie and Abby. First of all, thank you so much for coming on to this. This is a really fun discussion. We had so much fun. We had the best time. It was great. I know. But let our listeners know, where can they find you and your show on social media? Well, we are on Facebook at Good Morning Nancy, Twitter at Good Morning Nan, and Instagram at Good Morning Nancy Podcast. And that's morning with an O U. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so. Wordplay in, in the cool episode. <gasps> yes! 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 <laughs> uh, well, if you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at Horror Queers. Join our Facebook Horror Queers group to hang out with other listeners. You can find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered and of course go to our youtube channel to check out our micro queers videos well right now our micro queers are actually chucky recaps we're doing those week to week so please Mm -hmm. go watch joe and i talk about chucky while we hold our respective chucky dolls in the camera frame those things are fucking scary yeah it's creepy (laughs) um if you have a moment please go rate and review us on apple podcasts and if you want even more horror queers content please support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horror queers we are at the end of October, um, we will announce our November schedule next week. But in the meantime, you can go sign up for our Patreon and get episodes on Slasher Flesh and Blood, Midnight Mass, Halloween Kills, audio commentary on Child's Play 2. And if you're listening to this before Halloween, we will be having an episode on Paranormal Activity Next of Kin before sure. November 1st. <laughs> yeah. Wow, this sounds like so much fun. <laughs> I know. What the even heck? October has been really crowded with horror content. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's the time of year. Yeah. It's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. I know, but, I you know, mom out. brain. <laughs> we're not complaining, but also we're so tired. <laughs> yes, we yes. are. Well, and Ugh. this is the end of October for us. So, Joe, we are kicking off November with, I mean, a movie. What is it? <laughs> oh, my God, Trace. Uh, yeah, so, folks, we are celebrating our 150th episode next week. So Ooh. we're going to break out a big gun. This is going to be interesting because Trace and I don't 100% love this movie, but I think it's time for a rewatch. Yeah. And we're going to check out Joel Schumacher's The Lost Boys. Oh! oh. Listen, I don't 100% love that movie either. Okay. And I feel like I'm in the in the minority, so Absolutely. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about it. I, yeah. No, I, it's same. I feel the same way. Oh my god, I'm so excited for that episode. Yeah. <laughs> I heard about it growing up. I watched it once when I was in college at the age of 19. And oh, I, young Trace. Hmm. I didn't dislike it. I was just kind of like, oh, that's it. Like, that's yeah. all this is. Okay. Mm-hmm. So... 
yeah, I feel like it appeals to people from a certain age range. Like mm-hmm. if you grew up with this, this might have been a mainstay staple of your horror diet, in which case I think you have very strong feelings about it. And I just don't think that's yes. us. So I'm interested yeah. to see if we can come back and appreciate it when we have to do a concentrated deep dive on it. And we will have a guest who loves the movie as well. Yeah, yeah. We like to counterbalance the episodes where we're like a little bit lukewarm. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Well, everyone. All right. Uh, Have a happy and safe Halloween. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think we can cross out Clue. Please. Yes. (laughs) Cross out (laughs) Horror (laughs) Clue. Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep, a podcast where I tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror. This is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares, like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts, or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams.